All right, good morning everyone. My name is Jeff Scott. I will be the instructor for the online AWD 1100 or 1100 C Sharp programming class that you are signed up to take this summer. Today is day one. We will be going Monday through Thursday from 8 a.m. until 2.30 p.m. between now and I believe our last day is somewhere around August 17th. We'll have a couple days off during that time. You will be off two days or two weeks from today for Memorial Day on May 29th. You'll also be off on Tuesday, July 4th. All right, as of right now, I have no one joining me live, which is totally fine. All right, some days I may have people who are online with me. Some days I may not have anyone online with me. So I sent out an email earlier this morning, and I'd like to first start by going over that email. As it says here, there's about five or six things we're going to do today. The first thing is I'm going to go over some of these C sharp related URLs in just a couple minutes. Then we'll go over the syllabus and I will go out to my YouTube channel and show where that is. Following that, if <clears throat> good morning, I'm just starting up and uh, I'm basically letting students know what we're going to be going over today. So in just a couple minutes, we're going to go through some very quickly some C sharp related URLs. After that, I'm going to go through the syllabus, show you where my YouTube channel is, and you can see it if you click on the uh, link that's there. Now, for some of you, this is the first class that you've taken at Rankin in the AWD or Application and Website Development Program. For some people, it's the second class. The reason I'm mentioning that is if it's your first class, then when we get to step two, I will expect you to install Git with me. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. We're going to do it together. All right. After that, we're going to install GitHub, and I'm going to walk you through the steps as far as what you have to do in there. Then after that, we're going to install the big piece of software. All this stuff is free. All right. We're going to install something called Visual Studio 2022 Community Edition, and that's going to be interesting because I installed it on my machine about two years ago and have been using it since then, but I decided for you guys, I uninstalled it, so I have nothing on my machine for that. So I'm going to be going through all of it with you. All right. All right. Then I'm going to show you after we've gone through Git and GitHub a little bit, I've actually got all of the material, almost all of the material you're going to need for the semester. I put it out on the internet. I'm going to show you how to get it. All right. After we go through that, we'll go over chapter one today of our textbook. Now, I have a PDF copy of this in addition to a hard copy. So when we get to that point, I'm going to be going over the PDF copy with you. Also, just so you know, there are other instructors at Rankin. And what some of them do when they teach online courses is down in the bottom right hand corner of their screen, they show a picture of them as they're talking. I don't do that. It's just the way I am. All right. And I again, I don't require that anyone be online with me. It's always nice if we have one or more people who are online with me, because that way, if they have questions as we're going along, you know, they can turn on their mic and they can ask the question. I can attempt to answer it. Now, if for some reason you watch this tape later, and you have a question, or even if you're watching it now and later you have a question, you should already know this, but my email address 
is jpscott at rankin.edu. Feel free to email me at any time. All right. I mean, I will, I typically, you know, I've got, uh, my email is on my phone and it's on the laptop that I'm using right now. And I try to get back to you as soon as I can. So that's pretty much the plan for today. So sometimes at least when people get into a class like this, one of the first questions they'll, or first statements they'll give to me is, I have no experience in this stuff whatsoever. How can I even get started? All right. So that's what this first thing is here. I, I came up with about a half dozen, I guess there's five URLs here. And the first one is from Microsoft itself. So if I click on this, this is a whole series of articles, introduction to C Sharp, and there are videos in here. You'll notice part one of 19. There'll be videos. Some of these are very well done. Some of these you might be bored by. Sometimes, you know, the people people like to go and read the, read through this stuff. Sometimes they hate it. Everyone's different in the way they learn. You know, some people are totally visual learners. So I've got a few different URLs that you can take a look at as well. All right. This right here, if you took the class with me last semester, and a few of you in this class did, you took a class with me last semester, AWD 1000 Web Development Technologies. In that class, we went over web design. And the reason I'm telling you that is one of the first days of class, I went out to w3schools.com. W3 is an acronym for World Wide Web. All right, and it's this, this is just free stuff that's out there. And if I go over to tutorials, you'll notice that one of the tutorials that's out there someplace is there's Learn C Sharp. This is very well done. There are many things that are in here that we go into. There are a few things in here that we either don't go into or just lightly touch on. But that's another one. If you're looking for a place to get started, not a, not a bad place. All right. Next. Now this right here, that's a little bit old. When I say it's old, the language isn't old, but some of these videos, these videos are about three years old. There is a gentleman who works for Microsoft. His name is Bob Tabor, and he has created a video series, C Sharp Fundamentals for Absolute Beginners. I went through this a couple of years ago. It's very simplistic. He's got a very nice speaking voice. He's very easy to listen to. And again, sometimes, like I said, people are just looking for a little more, all right, than they're getting in class or maybe brought to them in a different way or whatever. All right. Then next, there's a couple more that I found. <clears throat> this is a complete C Sharp tutorial for beginners to advanced from a website called C Sharp Tutorials or C Sharp Corner. And you'll notice it's 36 parts. Now, again, I, you know, people always ask, well, do I have to go through all this stuff? You don't have to go through any of it. All right. But if you're interested, these are just a couple more references for you to take a look at. And the last one, again, just in case you're interested, I take a lot of classes online. All right. And I go out to a site that's called udemy.com. Udemy or Udemy, it doesn't matter. All right. And what they do here is, I mean, when you look at some of their, their courses, like if I come in here and type in C sharp and hit enter. All right. They'll look notice 6,600 results almost. And some of these I'm like, I'm not going to pay $110 for a class. Give me a break. $95, 119. But typically what they do just about every month is they take and make almost all their classes like 1099. Well, that's that's something that most people can afford. Now, if you say, well, not me, I get it. So notice if I come down here and I click filter, all right, I can go down and I can it can say price. Ah, free. They have 783 free courses in C sharp. 
free, 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 etc. <clears throat> and I went through and just brought up the link for, for just one of those classes. All right, right here. Now, if you do want to sign up for one of these classes, you do have to go out to Udemy and sign up for an account. It's free. They don't deluge you with emails. I might get one a month just telling me that, you know, a bunch of their classes are on sale, and that's about it. All right, but notice again, 1,737 results for C-sharp programming. I can't tell you every one of these is free but I know many of them are, all right? And it's it's like anything else. If you've ever gone out online and looked at a video on a certain subject, some of them will be very good, some of them not so good, all right? As always, it just depends. So that's the first thing I wanted to do is just to quickly go over with you a couple other resources, references, if you're so interested. All right, then, Number one it says we're going to go over the syllabus and we're going to do that right now. Just so you know, every single lecture that we have in this class is going to be taped. I am taping right now. All right. And every single one of those lectures will be put out on my YouTube channel. So if you go out to here, there is, I've already got 30 lectures for the YouTube channel for this course. I went through most of the book. I went through most of the book already and set up lectures for most of the chapters that are in here. This is in addition to the stuff you get for the class. All right. And the reason for that is I just took my time, went through everything and I figured, well, maybe some people would get something out of this. All right, now with that said, just before, because I'm going to go over the syllabus right now. There's the syllabus. But I do want people to understand that if you are planning on getting a degree, all right, because, you know, I've, I've people will sometimes stop me during this part of the lecture and go, yeah, what kind of degree do we get from here? You get what's called an AT degree. That's an Associates of Technology. Now, some schools, some two year schools, instead of an AT degree, they offer an AAS degree, and that's an Associate of Applied Science. You can get that one as well. The difference between getting an AT degree from Rankin Technical College and getting an AAS degree from Rankin Technical College is if you want the AAS degree, you've got to take a couple more math classes. I don't know any more about it than that. All right, but if you're interested in that, send me an email and I will give you, I will put you in touch with, with people who can answer all those questions for you. All right, so the name of our program is AWD, Application Web or Website Development. And you can see AWD 1000, AWD, all these AWDs, that's what this is. All right, now, if this is your first class, then come fall, you'll take this class right here. If this is your second class, you already took the class in gray last semester. So the difference between these is if this is your first class now, the order in which you'll take the classes will be two, one, three, four. And if this is not your first class, you're taking it one, two, three, four and there really is no difference, all right? The expectation of people in this class right now is that you have virtually no programming experience. If you already have some programming experience because you took this class, of course, it will help you. But if you don't have any experience, it will not hurt you, all right? I will tell you that my plan is Whenever we're about to have what's called a hands-on test or a hot, then typically the day before, I'll give you what I call a pretest. It's kind of like the test. There's different problems on it, but it's set up the same way. And I will give you an hour or two to work on it. Then I will create the test from scratch right before your eyes. 
So that should do nothing but hopefully help prepare you for actually taking the class or taking the test, I should say. Now, in this class, I don't want to sit and read this stuff to you. All right, this is a class in C sharp programming. All right, there's, you know, that's the best I can tell you in one line. You know, because in here they say C sharp and object oriented programming. That's true. But we don't get to object oriented programming until chapter 12. Before that, we're learning most everything you can learn about C sharp. All right. So, like I said, if you if this is your first class, then you will take this class right here in um, in fall. If this is your second class, then you will take this class in fall. All right. And my regular YouTube channel, that's it out here. All right. So I'm again, I'm just going to go on then. Please feel free as we're going through this. If I say anything that doesn't make sense or you want to stop me for whatever reason, feel free to do so. All right. The next two things that we're going to do in here is we're going to do a couple of installs. I know there's another one, but these two should go fairly quickly, hopefully. All right. Now, the first install that we're going to do here, you're going to have to go out to this first URL that's right here. All right, I'm going to click on that in just a moment. So why are there two URLs there? Because sometimes people go in and they click on the URL and they do the software install that I tell them to do. And then it's after class and they're like, I have absolutely no idea why I downloaded this or what it's supposed to do. So this is a 15 minute long video, not made by me but it's called learn Git in 15 minutes. Then we'll do a similar thing with GitHub. And this is a video by the same guy, learn GitHub in 20 minutes. All right, so what is what are Git and GitHub before we go through this? Git is what's called a software versioning system. What that means is we're going to use Git and GitHub together and they will allow you to take anything that you create this semester and save it out to the internet. All right. Sometimes people will say save it out to the cloud, but we're saying the same thing. When you create these things that you're going to save out to the internet, you will make them all private, which means you're the only one that can see them. Now, after you do that and you make them private, and I'll show you this in a bit, all right, you will send me an invite to your work. So it's private for everybody except you. And after you send me an invite, me. All right. I don't write on your code. I don't do anything on your code, except that's a way for me to grade things. So you might say, well, why don't I just email it to you? Because after a, a while, these files, these programs that you create are going to have a lot of different files in them, and they will get so big that they're too big to email. I believe that at Rankin, it's about five meg or five million bytes of information. That's about all you can put into an email. I could be wrong on that. So this is why we use Git. So Git is going to allow you to basically save stuff on your own machine and set it up in such a way that you'll be able to send it out to the internet. But when you send it out to the internet, that's where GitHub comes in. All right, because you will have not only a Git that you're going to set up in a couple of minutes, but a GitHub account. I'm going to tell you how I'd like you to name your GitHub account. All right, if you decide you don't want to name it that, there's nothing I can do about it, but I'm going to show you the name I'd like you to use because it'll make it easier for me to find things. So we're going to do these two things next. Then when we get done, we're going to do something that's actually going to take quite a while because we're going to install the major piece of software that we're going to use this semester. And fortunately or unfortunately, it's pretty big. And it'll take a while to install. And that's OK, because while it installs, we can talk about other things. That's totally fine. So 
So before I jump ahead into this other stuff that's in here, let's go to here. So again, you can either click on this URL or you can type it in. And if you do type it in, you don't need to type in the HTTPS colon slash slash. In fact, I think you can just type in get slash SCM.com. I think if I just put in this right there, just that, I think it'll work just fine. I'm going to try that. So get G-I-T hyphen SCM, and SCM stands for Source Control Manager dot com, and then hit enter. And if you get something that looks like this, it worked. Now, we haven't installed anything yet. We're going to do that next. All right, but if you get out to here, this is where you have to be in order to download the software the Git software you're going to need. Before we do that, just so you see this, there is a free book that's right online that as we go through this stuff, you'll be like, I don't really get this Git. Well, there's a free book out here that's several hundred pages long. It's all online and it'll go through tons of stuff with you. All right, I'm, I'm gonna go by the 80-20 rule. I'm going to give you 20% of what's in this book that you will use 80, if not closer to 100% of the time. You can even download the book for free. It's an electronic copy if you want to do that. You can download it as a PDF. Do you need to do that? No, not at all. But if you have any questions, you can do that. All right. So in just a second, I'm going to bring up the newest version. All right, I already had this on my machine, but I removed it so I can get the latest and greatest version, just what you have. And I'm going to click right here for Windows. Just so you know, when I click that, it's going to bring some stuff. I'm using the Chrome browser. If you're using Edge or you're using Firefox, it'll work similarly. It really doesn't matter what browser you use. I will recommend you use Chrome because I think it's the easiest to work with. If you don't agree, if you've been using Edge forever or Firefox or Safari or something else, then use that. It's not going to hurt anything. But when I click this download for Windows right here, it's going to start downloading right in here. All right, so that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to click download for Windows. All right, and it says, what do you want in here right now? Well, the chances are really, 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 really good like 99.999% that <clears throat> you've got a 64-bit machine, all right? And I'm taking for granted that you've all, you're have all you all using a Windows machine. If you're not using a Windows machine, you can still download this because there's a version for Mac or for Apple machines. You might run into some problems <clears throat> if uh, if you use a Mac. I'm not saying you will. I'm not saying you won't. All right, but I'm going to click right here where it says 64 bit Git for Windows setup right there. I'm going to just click on that link. And now it's starting to download it right here. And where it's starting to download it in my bottom left hand corner, I'm going to right mouse click and choose open when done. And all I'm telling it is after everything's loaded, there it is. I want to go and I want to basically install this. Now, two things, you may or may not get this. If you get this, what it's saying is, hey, do you really want to allow your app to do this? And yes, I do. The other thing is that in the background, that's my granddaughter. So you'll see her a lot um, when you see my screen. So I'm going to click yes here. <clears throat> now it comes up and it looks like this. And what's nice about this is virtually everything that's in here that we do next virtually everything if not everything is we're just going to accept the default options so from right in here you can read this if you're interested or print it out but i'm going to click next and it says hey i want to go and save this i'm going to save this under under for me at least it saves things off to my c drive under program files, and it's going to call it Git. If your main drive <clears throat> is the D drive and not the C drive, it doesn't hurt at all. It's totally fine. So I'm going to click Next again. 
and it says the folder already exists. Would you like to install to that folder anyway? I removed it, but I guess I didn't remove the folder. Yeah, I'm going to say yes anyway. You, sh you probably won't get that message. If you do, it doesn't hurt. Just install over it. This basically is what in here do you want? The big things are in here. We want to make sure we've got Git Bash and Git GUI. All right, so I'm just going to leave all these exactly the way they are. I'm going to click Next again. All right. <clears throat> and now it says select start menu folder. Well, by default, it's going to start the Git, and that's fine. So I'll click Next again. All right. Now it says what editor you want to use. This, honest to goodness, I don't know why they put this in there because it doesn't matter what you choose. This has really nothing to do with what we'll be working on. So just click Next. All right. Now it says adjusting the name, et cetera, and let Git decide or override. It, again, this really doesn't matter. So I'm just going to let Git decide and I'm going to choose Next again. And then this is some internal settings. You know, what do you want to have done? It's best just to leave it the way it is and click Next again. All right. And then the same thing here, just click Next again. All right. And looks like we got one more. I'm going to click Next again. All right. And again. And again. And again. And one more time. Again. Uh, we don't need this. Now, if you notice, it's changed now. I'm about to click the middle button. Now it says install. This will actually take the, the software and it will put it on our system. So I'm going to click install. This literally should take a matter of uh, no more than a minute. All right, mine is done. Now, you don't have to view the release notes. We don't have to launch it either. We don't have to do any of that. You can uncheck both of these and just click finish. And I'm going to show you now how you can tell whether or not this worked. All right. And that is I'm going to go out to my desktop. All right, so dismiss that. Sure. All right. So I'm out on my desktop. If you right mouse click on an empty spot on your desktop and you get this here where it says Git GUI here and Git Bash here, it worked. All right. If that if you, you think you went through all the steps and that didn't work, you're going to have to let me know and I will work with you individually on that. All right. But typically people get that up there without a problem. Now. There is a, a very GUI or animated version of this called Git GUI. You don't have to do this, but if I click here, it's going to bring it up. I don't want to use that. I use the old fashioned version, which is Git Bash here. What that means is we're going to run that from what's called a command line. All right, so it's going to look something like this. Of course, yours won't say JP Scott, but it'll be something like this. Don't worry about that right now. All right. So again, when you're doing this, because most of the people in this class are not watching this live, if you have a situation with this where something does not work, if you say, hey, I went through all your steps and it doesn't work, you're going to have to email me. I can set up an individual Microsoft Teams meeting with you on an as needed basis. All right. Don't know if we have another entry here. Let's see. All right. So again, if if you run into any problems doing this, we just went through and we installed Git. We just we also went, we confirmed that we had the install by going out to our desktop, 
right mouse clicking and seeing if we had a Git GUI here and a Git bash here. When we start, at least in this class, we're going to be doing virtually everything that we do to save with Git bash here. There's another way that you can do it as well. I'll show you that just not right now. All right. All right, so the next thing it's following my lead here as far as so we've gone over. All right, and we went over some URLs. I have not really gone over the syllabus with you. I just wanted to get us going on that. Um, on the on the software installs because some of them take a little longer. All right, so we will go over the syllabus. Just take my word for it. But if we can get all of these software installs started before about 8.55 or so when we'll take a 10 minute break, that'd be great. All right, so we went through here. I had you click here and that brought this up. This was installing Git thing. All right, and all you really need again is the git-scm.com. If you run through problems or you wanna learn a little bit more about Git, you can click on here and this is Colt, Colt Steele's 15 minute long Learn Git in 15 minutes. All right, so the next thing we're going to install is GitHub. So Git allows you, for lack of better words, to kind of package up everything you're working on on your own machine and get it ready to send out to the internet. All right, and GitHub is basically where we're going to send it. Now, I'm going to click on this that says HTTPS GitHub.com. It's going to look nothing like yours, just so you know. All right. If you go out to GitHub.com, all right, it's going to be as if I went in here and signed out. Yours should probably look like this. All right. That would be my guess, at least. All right. And if that's where you are right now, that's great. So what I want you to do is click on the button here that says sign up, or I think you can come down to here too if you want. All right, I'm only going to go to a certain point here because I've already got an account, but I'm going to click the button here that says sign up. All right, it says welcome, you know, enter your, you know, here, enter your adventure. Now I'm going to put in a mythical email address. I am putting in a mythical email address. All right, because if I put in my address, it'll probably tell me there's already an account by that name. For here, you should put in, please put in your rank and email address. I realize you might have a Gmail address or a Hotmail or a Yahoo address, but please put in whatever your rank and email address is, where you get your emails for the class, et cetera, from. So again, I'm just going to mythically put in here, hello at hello.com, all right? Now it says email is invalid or already taken. Yeah, all right. So I, I again, I'm making that up. Don't, don't, please don't put that in. So I put in hello 4444 at hello.com, all right? So yours, if your name is, you know, um, John Smith, it might be John underscore Smith at insiderankin.org, that kind of thing. All right. So the, again, put in your rank and email address in here and click continue. Now it says create a password. And I will tell you, please write this password down because sometimes when you get into, in, 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 get into GitHub, it'll let you write in. Other times when you want to, when you either want to get into GitHub or if you're in GitHub already and you want to do certain operations, it may ask you for your password. All right. You should also take this password and make it hard enough so that if somebody else, you know, tried to get into your account, it would be hard for them to get in there. Okay. And there's lots of ways that you can do this. Okay. I mean, but what I'm saying is don't make it, don't make a password like, uh, I love GitHub or something like that. 
if you really want to make something that's a little more difficult, you can go out and go to the internet. You don't have to do this, but I'm going to write um, password generator. All right, and there's a lot of free ones out there. Okay, and it'll say, well, what do you want in here? I don't like this one. I never saw that one before. Okay, you could grab this one. All right, see how, notice when I refresh, it's giving me, so I'm just going to grab that one right there. Now, you don't have to do that. If there's something that's got some meaning to you and you want to put that in, go ahead. All right, and notice it's also 12. You can make this as big as you want. I would not recommend making it 50 characters. I would not recommend making it a single character. I'd recommend a minimum of eight and a maximum probably of 16. All right, I'll put it in the middle there and I'll put in 12. All right, and I'm just gonna grab this. And I'm gonna come back into here and I'm gonna put that in for my password. Now, if you do want to see it while you're typing it in, you can click on the little I right there. All right. And once you put all that in, notice it says here, oh, OK, it says it's strong, but it says make sure it's at least 15 characters or at least eight characters with a number and a lowercase letter. Well, I've got a number. I've got a lowercase letter. I've got an uppercase letter. I've got a dollar sign. That's fine. You'll also notice in here that it says the password is strong. What you don't want to do, and I'm just going to for, for a second, I'm going to remove that, is you don't want to make a password like password, like that. All right, so it says it needs an upper or lowercase letter. Well, I've had people do this before. Capital P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D, and then one, two, three. And it's even telling you right here, your password may be compromised. In other words, it's so simple that people may be able to guess it. But again, putting in something like I showed you previously, something like that is going to be much harder for people to guess. All right, so I'm putting that in and I'm going to click continue again. Then it says enter a username. This is important. I'd like you to put the following. OK. I'd like you to put in your first initial, your middle initial if you have to, or if you have one rather, your last name, Rankin. So for instance, my username is JP Scott Rankin. Now it says uh, Rankin. Now it says that's not available because I'm using it. All right. But on the other hand, if my name was John Scott, I couldn't use it either. But maybe if it was John Scott, but my middle initial was O, I could put in J.O. Scott Rankin. And you'll notice that that's available. All right. I'd like you to set your username up like that because it's much easier for me when I'm going and looking for your stuff to be able to put in your two initials, your last name, Rankin. All right. Now, some people haven't done that. Some people just put in their first initial and their last name or whatever, and I'll work around that as best I can. All I'm telling you is this, make, this makes it easier for me. All right. So put in your username. Again, you've got notice it's telling you we've got an email. We've got a password. We now have a username. I'm clicking continue again. Now it says, would you like to receive product updates and announcements via email? This changes so infrequently, I'm going to recommend that you put an N in there for no. If you really want to, you can. All right. And also notice on the bottom of the screen, it says by creating an account, you agree to the terms of service. If you don't know what those are, you can put your mouse here later and you can click and it'll bring it up. You can print it out, whatever. What they're saying basically is you're not gonna be using this for evil purposes, whatever that would be. All right, I'm gonna click continue again. All right, and it says verify this account. What they're doing right here is they are trying 
to make sure that you're a human being and not a robot program that somebody had put in there. So just click here where it says start puzzle. All right, it says pick one square that shows two identical objects. Well, those aren't, those aren't, those aren't. Looks like this one to me, a 25 and a 25. So I'm going to click there. All right, now it's asking me to do it again. Well, I'm going to click here. All right. Now it says create account. If you get to that point, you click here. What that's going to do is it's going to send an email to your account. Now, I don't have an account called hello 4444 at hello.com. All right. But you should, if you put in your rank and email, you should be able to go there and you get this eight numbered character. So I'm going to stop right now because I cannot go on because I don't have a hello at hello.com. All right. But I'd like you to go back, please, and take a look. All right. And once you've got that, put in those eight numbers. I'm not even going to try to guess it because there's just way too many combinations. All right. I'm going to say never here, but that should get you basically set up. All right. So you should now have Git on your machine and a GitHub account where you can save stuff off out onto the internet. All right, so let me close. I've got a lot of stuff open here, so let me just close a few things. And again, if you want some more information on that, already mentioned this to you, but if you do want some more information on that, there is a 20 minute thing from from Cold Steel. Learn GitHub in 20 minutes. And I've watched both of them. I've shown them in class before. All right. I don't think we really need to do that. I think you can watch it on your own and that'll make it as simple for you as possible. All right, let's go up to step four here. Let's start to install the biggest piece of software we're going to need here on step four. And while that is installing, we're going to get it started. And while it is installing, we're going to go back to step one here, and we're going to start to go over the syllabus. Now, there's about 54 or 55 days in this class. Sorry, I'm not going to go over all 54 or 55 days. All right, the syllabus is about 15 to 20 pages long, but we're going to go over it probably until we take our first break. So before we do that, I'm going to click on this visualstudio.microsoft.com right here, and it should come up and look like this. Now, I haven't done anything with GitHub Copilot. Co I know what it is. I don't want to talk about it because I know nothing about it. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start scrolling down here and where it says meet the Visual Studio family. All right, this is where I, I, a couple things I want you to hear. First thing, if you are using a Mac or an Apple machine, you'd need this one. We are not using Visual Studio code. This is a different piece of software that many of you in the class downloaded last semester because that was our primary editor of choice for the AWD 1000 class. This is not that class. All right, so what I'm going to do is I think if I yeah, if I take my mouse and I put it notice if I put it over this drop down right here. All right. I told you before that all of the software for this class, in fact, all of the software for every class in the program is free. All right, so you don't want to choose professional 2022. You don't want to choose enterprise 2022. That has some features and some functionality that will not be available to us because we're using the free version. The free version that we're going to use, 
So what I want you to do is take your mouse then, put it over Community 2022 and click. Now, what it's doing is it's downloading something here that says Visual Studio Setup.exe. I'm again going to right mouse click and I'm going to choose open just like we did before. All right, and it comes back up again. Yours may do this and it may not. And I'm going to click yes again. All right, it says before you get started, we need to set up a few things for you before we can start the installation. All right, so I'm just going to click continue. So it's looking and what it's looking for is, do you have enough, in, uh, enough space on your machine to hold this software? All right, do you have an older copy of the software on your machine already, et cetera? All right, so my hope is that you get to this point right here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to go on. I'm going to stop for a minute because if you have a, a, a internet connection that's a little slower or whatever, you might not get this. But I want to show you what we're going to choose. All right. Now, if you look in here, there's six things right here. And if I keep going down here, you'll notice that there's more. Not a lot, maybe a dozen, 15, it doesn't matter. All right. Now, if you want to go and get a little bit ahead, so to speak, if you want to get a little bit ahead, this is one you're going to need for the last class that you take here. You don't have to install it now, but you can install it now. It's totally up to you. All right, but I'm going to click it anyway. The ASP.NET or ASP.NET and web development. Again, you don't have to do that one if you don't want to. You can go back and use this installer and bring it back later. We're not going to, we don't want any of these. We don't want the Azure. We don't want Python. We don't want Node. We don't want this multi platform. Let's see, what is this? This says .NET Desktop Development. We do want that one right there. So on this first screen that you see that came up, we want, again, this is optional. You can either choose ASP.NET and Web Development or not choose it, but you do want to choose. This is the key piece of software. You do want to choose .NET Desktop Development. Do not choose any of the other ones that you see in here. So now I'm going to arrow down or go down. We do not need this desktop development with C++. We do not need universal Windows platform development. We do not need mobile development with C Sharp. We do not need game development. All right, so what's left that we do need? Right here, where it says data storage and processing. It says develop test solutions with SQL Server. When we get to the end of this class, chapters 19, 20, 21, and 22, the last four chapters of our textbook are going to be on databases, and we will need this. So click that one. Now, it says the space required is a lot, 10.34 gig. So if you've got an older machine or a machine with not much storage on it, then I'd say get rid of that one. Don't use that one. It doesn't knock it down a lot, but it knocks it down to 9.38 gig. All right, but you do need .NET desktop development, and you do need, and this is the big one, as far as space, notice if I get rid of that, well, I guess it isn't that big. It's about a gig. So how big is this one here? All right, I don't know. So the, the three that I'm loading are ASP.NET and web development, .NET desktop development. You do need that one no matter what. And you also do need under other tool sets, data storage and processing. All right. And if you've got that, click the install button. This can take, believe me, 
especially if you've got a, a slow internet connection, this can take up to an hour. All right. So I'm going to just leave that where it is for right now and let it go, let it do its thing in the background. And I'm going to bring up our syllabus. All right. I'm going to go over this for about, I don't know, 10 minutes or so, and then we'll take a 10 minute break. All right. So. Some of this should just make sense to you already. You know the course number and name. You know when we meet, you know the class time. This I'm. This may be wrong. I put 55, it might be 54. I don't know, it's really not that big a thing. All right, we're not in a building or a room. I am literally in my house right now in one of the bedrooms in my house broadcasting from here. I may or may not go in to Rankin and broadcast in there. The problem with me doing that is since it's an online class, they typically don't have a classroom for me. So I've got to literally go into a closet because I've tried already broadcasting from my office in there. And there's always people coming in and out and it gets very hard because it gets very noisy. This is my information right here. I will tell you, if you want to get a hold of me, do not call that number. Because as I told you, that's that'll ring in the office and I'm almost never in there. Email me at jpscott at rankin.edu. All right. I will turn it around. I promise you as soon as I possibly can. In addition, these are my office hours. So I'm on the computer at 630 every morning and I'm there from 630 until we start at 8. And then. The class ends at 2.30 and I'm on for another hour and 15 minutes. Now, with that said, all right, um, today and tomorrow, I will not have off afternoon office hours. I had something planned before I knew I was even going to be teaching a summer course. So today and tomorrow only, all right, once we finish at 2.30, all right, I've got actually got appointments both days. All right, but other than that, I'll be online from 2.30 p.m. till 3.45. Now, if you are working and you get done at 3 and you get home at 4, you can still email me and I'll do the best I can to answer your email before the next class session. All right. Okay. If you are in the AWD program, if you are in the application and website development program, this is what you should learn from the classes that you take. You'll notice that two of those bullets that are right there, two of the bullets are bolded. That's what we cover in this class. So we cover develop, troubleshoot, and implement applications using object-oriented principles and fundamentals. And in this class, we cover utilize a version control system to manage code. In fact, that version control system is what we did at the beginning of class. All right, when we went in and we worked with Git and GitHub. All right, our book. Again, if you want to, you can click on the link. This is it. Now, I have gotten emails from one or more of you saying, hey, um, the book that they said at the bookstore we need was version seven. You've got version eight. You really should have eight because why not? Why shouldn't we use the most current version possible? If you've already bought seven and written in it or whatever, all right, you should be OK with that. We should be able to work around it. But if you have not yet bought it, get version eight. As it says, you can buy it. You've got your choice. You can buy a hard copy. You can buy an electronic copy, which is going to end up looking something like. Like this. All right, where you can work your way through it. It's a big PDF, basically. All right. Or for, I think it's $72, you can get them both. All right. And that's totally up to you as far as how you do that. But you should have a copy of the book. There is no way that I can go through every line of code and every word that's in this book. All right. I'm, I'm going over the stuff that I consider to be the most important. All right, this is my main YouTube channel right here. 
All right, so if I go to here and bring that up, all right, I guess that's the one for this class. Like I told you before, there's 30 videos out there already. If for some reason you ever lose this or whatever, you can always just type in Jeff Scott Rankin Technical College and you'll find a little or a big red dot here and you click there and that'll bring you up and you can go up and you can just go to playlists and you can find the playlist for this class. Summer 2023 AWD C Sharp programming. All right. OK, let's continue on. I'm not going to read the course description to you. Read that on your own, but basically what this is saying is this is a class in C sharp. All right. After you get done with this class, this class, you should be able to do these six things. Again, I'm going to let you read those yourselves. By the end of the period today, my hope is we will have written two console applications and one GUI application. And if if we're going through those and it's like, I don't get any of this, then just watch. And work on it at your own pace and you should be OK. All right, again, I'm not going to sit and read the rest of them to you. The policies, if you've got questions on anything, you can go here. That'll bring you to the rank and handbook. All right, the attendance, if you don't know this, if this is your first class and you don't know it, all right, as it says, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. But since it's an online class, all right, you are never required to be here, but you will have homework that will be due every Sunday. We're going to go over that in just a minute. All right, if you turn in any of that homework by Sunday, so if you've got six assignments and you turn one of them in, your mark present for the week. If you turn in absolutely nothing, you're marked absent for the week. Now, you only get two absences. After you get two, so let's say it was this week and you turned in nothing, next week and you, you turned in nothing, all right? And now you do it again for a third week. I drop you from the class. With that said, you can appeal it. And Typically, 99 times out of 100, they'll let you back in the class if you've got a valid reason. Now, an invalid reason is, well, I didn't feel like doing the homework. No, but if you get into an accident or you're sick or whatever. Okay. Seated it doesn't make sense. There are no excused absences. It's expected in here that you're not going to cheat. Now, that said, I'll tell you this, and you may like this, you may not like this, but when we start taking tests, hands-on tests, where you're writing actual code, you will have the test sent to you by 7 a.m. on the test day. It'll be there, it'll be there, all right, in your rank and email by 7 a.m. You have until midnight that night to turn it in. At eight o'clock, the regular class time, I'll spend 10 to 15 minutes going over the test so you know what it's about, and I will tape that. All right, but I'm assuming you're going to do your own work, and that's what the academic honesty is. <clears throat> if you don't know, Rankin, I don't know why they make us put this in here like this. The thing that's wrong with this grade scale is Rankin does not give Ds. If you get a D, you have failed to satisfy the course requirements and you cannot go on, all right? So, you know, and I will tell you, like last last year with all my students, I gave them only A, Bs, and Cs, all right? I did not give any Ds, I did not give any Fs. This workload table, basically what this is saying is, you should plan on spending at least an hour outside of here for every hour you spend in class. Some people don't have to do that. Some people need to spend more time. It just depends on the person. All right, this is the weight. So you're going to have written tests. And every written test will be worth 10 points. There'll be, I don't know, 
there's 22 chapters. There probably won't be 22 written tests. There'll probably be more like 15 or 16. Let's say that let's say there's 20. All right. So if they're worth 10 points each. So that's 200 points. That's like two tests. 30% will be on your homework and labs. 50% will be on your hands on tests and a final project. We're not going to talk about that now. And 10% will be on your electronic portfolio. We're not going to talk about that now. I want to get to where just a few more pages, I guess one more page, then we're going to take a break. All right. If you have any questions on anything, the man you want to talk to is Mr. Patrick Glenn. Patrick's a terrific guy and he really knows his stuff. That's his phone number and that's his email. All right. If you've got a disability that the instructor has to know about, I don't think that's going to be a big issue in a class like this, but if it is, again, Patrick's your go-to guy. If you need career help, again, I put him down. The snow days, of course, since this is a summer, doesn't make any sense. The campus emergencies, the biggest thing on here is you know that the weather around here can be very temperamental. So. If we've got really bad weather here and I don't have an internet connection, then what I do is I get in my car and I drive over to the Rankin Wentzville campus and try to find a room I can broadcast from. If that happens, I'll do my darndest to send you an email as early as possible and let you know what's going on. All right. So, as it says, as this is an online class, Assume that classes will always be held. All right, so let me go just for a couple more minutes and just I'm going to give you a typical week by going through this week. So I'm only going to go through day one, two, three, and four from this, and the rest will go over. So we'll go over day one, two, three, four right now. Tomorrow we'll just go over day two. Wednesday we'll go over day three, etc. So today we're getting the introduction right now. I'm not really reviewing the handbook. I gave you a link to it. There really is no department handbook anymore. All right. Rankin, if you don't know this, you get two grades from Rankin. You get an A, B, C, or F, and you also get what's called a W, E, G, which is a work ethic grade. The reason I'm telling you that is, come on, there we go, that when you get those grades, it'll be one of It'll be either a DNM, an NI, a ME, or an EE. What the heck are all those? All right. DNM means does not meet. Why would you ever get a DNM? Well, you don't, not only do you not come to class, all right, you don't turn in any work. All right, that kind of thing. So you do not meet expectations. If you turn in work, but we've got six assignments and you're only turning in one every time, all right, and you're constantly behind, you get an NI, which means needs, needs improvement. If you get an ME, and I'm not going to lie to you, 99% of the grades I give with this being an online program here is I give MEs, which means meets expectations. You come to class, whether you're here, you know, in the actual class or whatever, but you're watching the lectures, you're doing the homework, etc. All right. If you go out of your way, so maybe you set up a study group for the people in your class or whatever, then you're showing that you exceeds expectations. So those are the four possible work ethic grades that you can get. But like I said, almost always, this is the one I give out. I've given one EE since our program has gone online. And that's because this guy did what I just said. He started a study group. All right. He was, on, he was online and he actually had his own hours where people could sit there and ask him questions. All right. He was a guy who literally three three semesters in, I was worried he wasn't going to graduate because after three semesters, he already had a professional programming job. 
All right, so that's those. So let, let's quickly. See. I'm going to skip that for now. And start Visual Studio. It looks like mine's already done, so that's good. So this is what we're doing today. Between today and tomorrow, we're going to go over chapters one, two, and three. All right. The good news for you, it looks like, wow, you're giving us all this. Look what's due already on Sunday. We're going to do the written test together for chapters one, two, and three. We're going to do those together. Not today, but we will do those. The homework and labs, we're going to do some of that stuff together as well. All right. So you'll always know here what's due and when it's due. So we're going to go over chapter one a little later today. All right, and you can see what's involved in it. I'm not going to read any of this to you. All right, tomorrow we're going to go over chapter two and chapter three. Then on Wednesday, I'm going to give you one of these pretests where I'm probably going to end up giving you about two hours. Some of you may get the first test is, is fairly easy. All right. Some of you may get this pretest done in literally 10 to 30 minutes, but I'm going to give you two hours. Then I'm going to do the pretest for you myself, and I'm going to do it from scratch. Then on Thursday of this week, you're going to have your first hands on test on chapters one, two, and three. And again, before you go like, oh my gosh, I could never, this is going way too fast. We do go kind of quick at the, at the beginning, and then we slow down as the material gets more and more complex. All right, so it is 9.06, and what I'd like you to do, let's take a break, and we're going to come back then at 9, let's make it 9.17, it's almost 9.07. So let's come back at 9.17. I got to refresh my water, and I'll be back in about uh, a couple minutes myself.
All right, it is 917, so I'm going to continue on. Now, I wanted to show you something here. You, your system, you know, your software, Visual Studio installer may still be up. You may still be installing. It really is OK. I'm not going to do anything with this right now, but I just want to show you this. All right, if at a later time you decide you want to uninstall something or you want to add something, one of the things that's going to be over here when you go to the bottom left hand corner of your screen is if you go through here, there should be what you see on my screen right now, which should be. Oh, is it under Microsoft? I always forget. Um. The Visual Studio installer, and that's this. So you can always come back at any time if you want. Notice I now have Visual Studio 2022 and it says new because it just added that. All right. Now I'm just going to close this because I don't need it to be open. All right. But I want to go back and kind of review. So we went over some URLs. We installed Git, and hopefully you had no problem with that. All right, if you did, again, this is a video that may end up giving you some help. We installed GitHub. Again, hopefully you had no problem with that. And this is another video you could watch if you wanted to. All right, we also went in and installed Visual Studio 2022 Community Edition. And finally, we went back over the beginning of our syllabus and we went through what we'll be doing in work in week one. Now, I'm not going to go through this yet. Number five, we will bring this stuff over before the end of the period. What I'd like to do next is to go over chapter one. All right. Now I want to show you something before we go through chapter one. All right. I am not a, a, a big guy for going over PowerPoint presentations. For lack of better words, I'm warning you about that right now. But what you are going to get by the end of the period today, I don't want to use that one. What you are going to get by the end of the period today, I want to show you this. All right, we're all going to download this together, so I'm going to I want to make sure you all have it. All right, but what you are going to get. Is a folder that's called C sharp. Uh, maybe it's not even called that, but we'll, we'll see what it's called. But what it's going to have in it, these are all of the written tests that you're going to be assigned for the year. This is what comes with a Muroc book. In other words, what Muroc gives you is every program that they go over in the book. They give you all the code for it. So those are your book apps. At the end of every chapter, they give you exercises. I'm never going to assign those because not only do they give you the exercise starting files, but they give you the solutions. All right. When we get to chapters 19, 20, 21, and 22, we'll take a look at this database. Don't worry about it right now. Just have it totally out of your mind. It's fine. All right. And these will be basically. Um, like I said, just stuff that we're going to go over. The other things that are in here, again, the written tests, the stuff from the book, these are the PowerPoint slides that come with the book. All right, so I'm not going to go over these, but if you look, for example, we're going to be in chapter one in just a moment. And if I brought those up and we went over them, it's how to get started with Visual Studio, it looks like there's not many. There's only about 18 slides. What I do plan on doing, because I want to be complete, is we're not going to go over the slides directly, but we're going to go over the book and we're going to go over the chapter. And after we go through the chapter, we'll click quickly flip through those slides. What I don't like is, and you probably have all seen this already, 
I know I've gone to plenty of meetings at Rankin and in other places I've been employed at where somebody will give a PowerPoint presentation and will get up there and spend two hours reading PowerPoint slides. I feel in very many ways offended by that because guess what? I know how to read. I don't feel the need for that, but I do want to try to be sure to go over everything and not miss anything. All right. So as far as our homework and our lab work, we'll talk about this later today, but these extra exercises, those will basically be your homework and the extra labs will be your projects. We'll talk about all this later, so don't worry about it. All right. So again, I want to go through right now chapter one of this textbook. After we get done with chapter one, which will probably take us till our next break, then we will go over and we will bring this stuff in. I'm going to show you how to use Git and GitHub together. All right. And we'll do that. All right. And then we'll go through and actually write a couple programs. All right. You won't have to turn these in or anything else. And my hope is if you have questions as we're going through this stuff that you'll ask. All right. OK, so with all that said. Let me just jump into our textbook again. I want to close a few of these things because I got lots of stuff open here. All right, so again, this is our textbook. Murox C Sharp 8th edition. And in this textbook, we have 22 chapters. And guess what? We're going to go over all of them. Now, some of them we're going to spend more time on than others. All right. But just so you have a little bit of an idea of how the class is going to be broken down, I want to show you this. This is something I made that was a while ago. So where are you? Right here. All right, so we're in week one. So this week we're going to go over the first three chapters. Then you can see it goes two chapters, two chapters, two chapters, two chapters, and then one chapter. All right, then everything else is basically two per week. So you can see, I'm not going to read this to you. You can see how it's set up. And then at the end, you're going to get three weeks to work on a final project. All right. So like I said, even though it might seem like this week, boy, you got you're really rushing through this. You know, if something doesn't make sense, stop me and we'll go back over it until it does make sense to you. All right. So with all that said, let's jump into the book. All right. So again, this is what we're going to cover this week. Section one out of five sections in the book. So the first 90 pages, basically. All right. So we'll talk about how to get started with Visual Studio right now. Tomorrow, we'll talk about how to design a Windows Forms app and how to code and test a Windows Forms app. And if you say, I don't know what that is, you shouldn't. We're going to have written a Windows Forms app by the end of the period today. All right. OK. So I'm going to just jump right into chapter one of the book. All right. If you've never used a Muroc textbook before, what you're going to find is the pages that are typically the pages that are on the left hand side. All right. So what, let me show you what I mean. All right. The pages that are on the left hand side, the even number pages are going to be text and the pages on the right hand side are going to be either pictures or they're going to be tables or they're going to be code and quite often at the bottom they're going to give you kind of a summary of what was over the last two pages just so you're aware of that all right so it, as it says here in this chapter it's how to get started with visual studio you can see that this is broken up into three sections we're going to get an introduction to what our .NET development will look like. I'm going to bring it up so you can see it. You don't have to memorize it. 
there'll be certain things that are going to happen that are going to be unexpected for you when that happens and if you you know you get lost or whatever again please just ask so we'll talk about what the .NET development environment is about then as it says starting on page 14 we'll take a tour of that environment that's about half the chapter and then finally we'll talk about how you can create and then test a project it's literally clicking a button all right so as it says up on top here this chapter is designed to get you started with C sharp programming. That's basically what it is. Right. Okay. What you're going to find is I'm not going to spend typically a lot of time on the pages that are on the left hand side because I end up then reading and I don't think people want to hear me read. All right. So I do want to mention, as it says here, the book teaches C Sharp by showing you how to create desktop apps. We're going to create two different types of desktop apps in here. The first type that we'll talk about, they're not, it's not shown exactly right here, but they're called console apps. If you've never heard of a console app, it's going to look like this. So in other words, when we run a console app, it's going to be a black background and white text. Now, those aren't very exciting, but it's important in you starting to learn the fundamentals of the language, so we will go over these. All right. The other type that you create, the other type are what are known as GUI or graphical user interface. Those are the Windows forms that they mentioned in here. All the other stuff that's discussed down here. WPF, XAML, UWP. We don't do any of that stuff in this class. None of it. Then at the bottom of the page, they talk about ASP.NET Web Forms and ASP.NET Core MVC, et cetera. That's what you take in the last class of the program. You use the same language you're going to use now but you use it in a different way. What we're writing in this class are what are referred to as desktop applications, things that will run right on your desktop. What you do in that last class is you write web applications, so stuff you can write something and actually download it to the internet. If you had your own website, etc. All right. So this is the kind of thing that we're going to create. All right, in fact, not today. If we have time today, we will. Otherwise, tomorrow we're going to create this application right here. And don't worry if you don't understand what future value is. Don't worry if you don't understand what monthly investment is. We'll talk about those. You know, occasionally I'll get a person who will email me or call me or whatever and say, hey, I want to get into your program but I, I don't do math. Well, you do have to do some math in this program, but usually it's just telling the computer what to do. All right, my guess is that virtually everybody watching this knows how to go in and create and how to use a calculator, all right? And you can kind of look at it that that's pretty much the same kind of stuff we'll do in here, but sometimes you'll have to tell this, the computer, hey, when we click this button right here, we want something to happen with what's in here, all right? So what you see up on your screen, I'm not gonna go over radio buttons or labels or text boxes or buttons, but what you see on your screen there is what's referred to as a Windows Forms app. It's a graphical user interface app. You can see that there's three boxes here that are white. That means that you can enter information into those. There's another box down here that's gray. That means it's read only. So when you put something in here and in here and in here, and you click the calculate button, you're gonna get something in there. And that's all it's saying, all right? And if you can just be comfortable with that for right now, you're fine. We will have whole chapters where we will go over like a later chapter, we'll go over radio buttons. They're not hard. 
the labels, the text boxes, and the buttons, believe me, pretty much by the end of this week, those will make sense to you. All right. And, you know, people say to me, you know, it's like, I want to do this for a living. I mean, what do I really, really and truly have to learn to be good? All right. One thing is that with most applications, when you click one of the buttons, you'll want something to happen in your program. Anybody can make an interface like this. Literally, I could spend about a half an hour right now with you and you could make this interface and make it look literally 100% exactly like what's on here. All right, and you'd learn a little bit, but that, that's no big thing. But programmers are paid for when you click the buttons that you're able to manipulate what's in here. That's what's important. That's what the majority of this class will be about. All right, so again, we will be creating Windows Forms this to you, but we're not going to be doing anything with Windows Presentation Foundation. We're not going to be doing anything with Universal Windows Platform. So this is the only one we care about. And these platforms for developing web apps, this again is what you take in your last class. If you remember when you were downloading stuff, one of the things that I said you could optionally include was the ASP dot net stuff that allows you to do this and we'll see what that class well we i just taught that class last semester so did mr god missed it mr g who's the my my counterpart one of my counterparts at the st louis campus we had not taught the class before because we changed the content from what it used to be that's not important but the point is the way that we taught that class it was all asp.net core mvc we did nothing with ASP.NET Web Forms. We did nothing with ASP.NET Core Web Razor Pages. It was just on this. Now that could change, but I don't think it's going to. All right, so finally on here, as you can see, we're going to be creating desktop applications. You literally will be able to save what we're creating to your desktop and run it right there, all right? what you create in the last class in the program are web apps and you can see what that says the desktop apps that we create are going to have controls on there so again this particular application has two radio button controls these two radio button controls are inside of another control that's called a group box this application has one two three, four label controls. It has one, two, three, four text box controls, and it has one, two button controls. Those are the kind of things that we're going to be working with throughout the semester. All right. So the next thing in there talks about Visual Studio, and I want to quickly, because I don't want to get off on a tangent, but I do quickly want to show you something. The people who were last semester who took the AWD 1000 class, we used what's called Visual Studio Code. This is it right here. So we would come in here and you do a file. And let, let, let me see if I can grab something that I've already got. So you can I just want you to see what it looks like. All right, so I don't want that one. Um, Let me do this. I don't want to waste anybody's time, but I want to show you something here. So this is the kind of thing that we did last semester. All right, you would create something in this editor, and then when you went to run it, so let me just grab something here, uh, t -t 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 there. When you went to run it, it would look like this. So this is a, a, a simple, it's meant to be a gym 
All right, for a fictional gym, let me get it down to 100%. So it looked like this. And then you could, you know, notice there's before and after pictures from people who have supposedly gone through our gym, etc. The reason I'm telling you this is last semester when we use this, this is a fairly simplistic editor that's called Visual Studio Code. What we are going to be using this semester is not a simple editor. We are going to be using something that is called Visual Studio, not Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio. All right. So when we come in here, I just want to show you this. I'm going to type in create a new project. And I'm going to come in here. Don't worry if it makes no sense to you, really. But I'm going to type in here Windows. Form. Should be finding something. I don't know why it's not. It's not. Uh, what I'm getting to, all right, not in a good way, but what I'm getting to, there it is, is what we're going to be doing in here. This is what I want you to understand. What we're going to be doing in here is we're going to be working with not a simple editor like we had last semester. We're going to be using working with what's called an IDE, which is an integrated development environment. So a little later today, we're going to bring this up on the screen. Don't worry if it makes no sense to you, really. All right. And we're going to come in here. And we're going to there'll be stuff that will come up in here in just a second. And we'll take it, for instance, if we want a button, just take it and we drag it up on our screen. All right, there's a button. If we want two buttons, now we've got two buttons. Right? And what I'm getting to is we're good. It's going to look similar in nature. Those of you who were in the class last semester, the editor will look similar, but yet it'll look totally different. And what I mean by that is some of the things that we go through will be similar, but this is a whole development environment. There's a lot of things that are automated in here. When you start to do something, sometimes you'll be given some helpful text where if you click a button or whatever, it'll go and do some stuff for you. All right. So again, if that doesn't make any sense, don't let it bother you, please. All right. So Visual Studio that we're using is an IDE or an integrated development environment. All right. We are using the Community Edition. That's the one I asked you to download. Why? Because it's free. You can use the professional or the enterprise, and actually it lets you um, download those for free for a month. Then afterwards, you either have to pay or it goes away. You just can't use it anymore. All right. I've never done any work with professional. I've never done any work with enterprise. All the work I've done always has been with the community edition. Now it's interesting because they say there it's appropriate for hobbyist students, etc. Anybody can use it. You can use this to build applications that you could use in business and industry. There are certain things that you wouldn't have available in the community edition again because it's free. All right. The major languages that are supported here. Back when I started teaching this, probably a good 10 or 12 or more years ago, the primary language at that time that we used was Visual Basic. And there's nothing wrong with Visual Basic, but as time has gone on, C sharp, which is C with a pound sign here has become more and more popular. And Visual Basic, probably less and less popular, to be honest with you. So again, as you see on the bottom of the page, we'll be using Visual Studio as our IDE. All right. And as it says, you, you choose what you want to install. We already went through all that stuff. We did the database stuff. You've got that in there also. Now it says, 
the additions of Visual Studio shown in the book are going to be the Windows version. There is one for Mac. I showed you that before, but everything that's in the book will be for Visual Studio. If you are going to be using a Mac or an Apple machine for this class, all right, then what I'm going to ask is that you please send me an email as soon as you can and let me know that. I'll try to work with you as best I can. I no longer have an Apple machine. So if you run into problems, I may not be of that much help to you. All right. OK, so the next thing that's discussed in here are the main components of the .NET framework. So let's look at the picture. As you get higher and higher on this picture up at the top, you can see it says .NET applications. That's closer, closer rather to a human being. As you get down lower and lower into the picture, and on the bottom there it says operating system and hardware, that's closer and closer to the computer. So that's closer to the human, that's closer to the computer. All right. <clears throat> you are going to work, <clears throat> excuse me, you are going to work in here totally with C sharp. We're not going to do anything with Visual Basic. We're not going to do anything with F sharp. You will do a certain amount of work in here. All right. With when we will use the Windows forms. The only way that we'll do anything with ASP.NET is if we're at the end of the semester and we have a day where I got a little time, we might draw, we might create a project together just so you can see what it's like. Otherwise, if we don't have time, we won't do that. When we get towards the end of the semester, in chapters 19, 20, 21, and 22, we will look at EF, which stands for Entity Framework, and EF Core. All right, so let's put those off until, I don't know, July or whenever. We will not directly work with the CLR, the Common Language Runtime, or languages or compilers. But when you go to run your program, that stuff, you will work with it, but it's all system stuff. You don't have to typically worry about any of that. So we're not going to talk about that now, but we will look at it a little bit in the future. <clears throat> so it says here, Windows Forms do not access the operating system. Why? Because we're up here. Notice this does not touch this. All right, if we want to do something here, we're going to be running through here. And that's all system stuff, and that'll be working in here. All right, so again, closer to the human, closer to the machine. I don't want to sit and read this stuff to you. All right, they talk about class libraries. Let's hold off on that really in a lot of depth, and we'll have a lot of that in a lot of depth starting in Chapter 12. We'll talk about classes and class libraries. Again, this common language runtime, the CLR, it's what works behind the scenes so that if you put in some code, the computer can understand what you're trying to do and it can spit back at you what you want spit back at you. All right. <clears throat> so. The IDE itself, this is it. Now it's very similar to what I just showed you, but it's not identical. So I want to run through the major things that are in here. You do not have to worry about memorizing these, but I do want to show you what's in here. All right. The first thing up on top is our menu. Most people are familiar with a menu. You've looked at it in one form or another. All right. Then underneath the menu, you've got basically the toolbar. Now, some of the stuff that's in here is the same stuff you can do here, but rather than having to click a menu option and then something else, you can just click something directly. Let me give you an example. This green button that you see right here, this is how we're going to run our programs. We're going to click that green button. Now, when you start to look at the rest of what's on here, this thing in here, so this is your menu and your toolbar. This thing in here is called your toolbox. This has all the things 
where you can click on something and drag it and put it over here. Basically, it's your tools that you use to build and put stuff on your form. So this is your toolbox. This whole area right here, it's called your form designer. That's where it's kind of like if you're an artist, it's your blank easel where you, you paint stuff onto it, for lack of better words. Now, you don't see it down here, but there's stuff that can come down here. This is where your error messages will show. And as we go on and we look at debugging, et cetera, in later chapters, some other stuff can show down here as well. This area, this first half, everything in white right here, is called your Solution Explorer. And you can kind of look at it. It's not exactly the same thing. But if you've ever done this, if you've ever brought up your file explorer, it's kind of like that. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's similar in nature. And what the Solution Explorer does is it shows you the solution you currently have up and any projects that might be in that solution and any files that might be in the projects. If that makes no sense, don't worry about it because you're going to be creating these. All right. And when you create these, you'll notice here there's a bunch of files here. The only one ones typically really the only one that we're going to be concerned with. All right. This thing that says FRM main right here, that file is this. And you can't see it in here. But there's another file, if I click on this here, that's got the code for this. Yeah, don't worry about it. You're going to see all this before the end of class today. All right. Finally, this last area that's down here, this is known as your properties window. So you'll notice right here, under text, it says calculate investment. That text that you see right there is this text that you see right here. So if I were to click on one of these boxes, this would change. Right now it says FRM investment. All right, and I guess that's actually the one that we've got, but it doesn't matter. So that's this. We're on the form itself. If you click on a button, this will change to the name of the button. You're going to see all this stuff. Typically when I go over this at the beginning of the semester, I'll have at least one person who either says out loud or emails me or thinks to themselves, I'm never going to get this stuff. And within a week or two, they're working on it without even thinking about it. All right. So as they say right here, this is what we're using Visual Studio for. All right, we're going to put drag and drop. We're going to add stuff to forms, period. Visual Studio, as mentioned there, also contains a code editor that, as it says, can be used to work with many languages. We don't care. We only care about C Sharp. We don't care about the other languages, so we don't care about Visual Basic. We don't care about F Sharp. Just C Sharp is the only one we care about. All right. Now, when you sit there and you create a program, so when you create a program, and you know, so you put some stuff in there. Where was that? Come on, there. So when you put this stuff in here, so I choose future value, and I make a monthly investment of $100, and I do that for eight year, for 8%, 8 for eight years, when I put all that good stuff in there and I click this, it runs a formula and says basically, if you put in $100 a month for 10 years, well, how many months is that? All right, that's 120 months, right? So if you do that and you put it in at 8% interest, then whatever you put in there, 12,000 or whatever, will now be worth this. All right, that's exactly what it's doing. And that's basically what they're saying in here. So what has to happen when you go through and do this is it, it's kind of like if you imagine I'm walking down the street and somebody stops me and uh, they start talking to me and they talk to me in a language 
that I don't understand. So I even though I do understand Spanish, let's say I don't understand anything about Spanish, nothing in the Spanish language. So somebody stops me and they start talking Spanish. All right. And I don't have any idea what they're saying. So I try to answer them back and they don't understand English. All right. Well, now imagine there's another person walking down the street and they know English and they know Spanish. All right. So they decide they're going to be the interpreter for the two of us. All right. So the person can sit there and they can say all this stuff that they want to say in Spanish. When they get done, then that person, the interpreter, will look at me and say, uh, they just said this. And then I answer them, and then they answer back. All right? Now, you might say, well, why doesn't the interpreter just talk? That, that's not what I'm trying to get to here. I'm trying to get to talking about compiling. So as the person is talking Spanish to me, and the other, the, the interpreter is either writing down everything they're saying or remembering it, even if they make some mistakes or even if there's some words they don't understand or whatever, they grab everything and then they spit it back at me when it's done. Even if there's errors in the language or whatever, that's what a compiler does. A compiler takes something that you key in, in English, and the only thing a computer can really understand are zeros and ones. So what the compiler does is it takes all that code that you put in in English and it basically compiles it or turns it into the zeros and ones that the computer can understand. And it goes through everything. Even if it finds errors, it flags those errors, but it keeps going. It can. So that's what they're going to show you here. All right. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this to you, the reason I'm taking a minute or two of time to say this is those of you who were in the AWD 1000 class last semester, we worked with a language called JavaScript, and that language isn't compiled right off the bat. It's interpreted. What's the difference? Well, again, if my interpreter is, let, let's say that the, the person who's the interpreter knows Spanish, but not fantastically. So now this person is talking Spanish and boom, 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 boom. So finally they get to a word and the interpreter doesn't know what that word means. So the interpreter says, stop, 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 stop. And he's got a Spanish to English dictionary and looks it up. Then writes down what that word means, then says, OK, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. That's an interpreted language. So a compiler keeps going. Even if it finds errors, it goes through the whole project. An interpreter makes you stop and fix your errors as you go. Well, when you compile a program, a C sharp program, it gets gets compiled into what's called MISL. MISL is an acronym that stands for Microsoft Intermediate Language. It's also known as IL, but typically it's known as MISL. All right. So all the stuff that happens in here, you can read it if you're if you're interested. All right. But it's all basically the act of of converting the English that you are typing into the program and taking that English and converting it from English to the zeros and ones the computer can understand. All right. So like I said, they go through that in here and that's totally you know, fine. You can, as long as you understand that much, you're fine. So they're showing you what's happening in here. You use Visual Studio. You use the integrated development environment to create your code. That code then is going to be compiled. All right. When you compile it, it gets compiled into Missile or IL. It adds whatever it needs, all right? It goes and it works with the CLR, but ideally on your screen, it's gonna show you what you want. And again, we're going to write a few very, very, very simplistic programs in a little bit, just so you can start seeing what this is all about. So you as a programmer, as they mentioned here, 
you create a project. And if you say what's a project, basically it's a folder that include that includes a bunch of stuff you need in order to get you know your your thing working. That project gets put inside of what's called a solution. Now on the previous page, because I didn't go through it, they mentioned a solution is a container that can hold one or more projects. Although it's possible for a solution to contain just one project, typically a solution will contain more than one project. And again, if this is all foreign to you, that is to be expected. All right, so when you go through this compilation pro process, as it says right there, it has to take the C sharp source code for the project that you created in English, and it's got to start to convert it to the MSIL that will be easier for the computer to understand. All right, and it stores it as in what's called an assembly. And then the .NET CLR, the .NET Common Language Runtime goes through and it runs the assembly. And if everything worked the way you wanted it to, all right, you're going to be able to, you know, to run your program and get output and ideally the output you were looking for. All right. So the next several pages here give you a tour of the Visual Studio integrated development environment. All right. Now I'd open this before and I'd already put this in. I'm not going to save this. I'm going to do a file exit and it's going to say, do you want to save? No, I'm just going to get rid of that. All right. Now to start this up, what there's at least two ways of starting. In fact, there's more than that. But ideally, by now, when uh, you install this, you've now got an icon down here that's kind of looks like a purple bow tie. I'm going to move mine way over to the end here so you can see it. You can either click that icon to get started, or if you say, I don't have that. All right, if you don't have that, you can come into the box here and you should be able to type in Visual Studio Studio 2022 and you can bring it up that way. All right. And then you can click on here. If you don't see it down here, if you don't see it down here, then you can right mouse click on it and choose pin to taskbar and that should put it down here. All right. The other way that you can do it too, if you want to, is you can click your Windows Start button over here, kind of the hardest way, but you can do that and go down. Notice I've got my recently added, so I could click it here, or I could go down all the way to the V's and find Visual Studio 2022 and do it from there. So whatever way you want to do that, ideally, you're going to have it on your taskbar and you're just going to click right there. All right. And it brings it up then. Now, this is your opening screen. Yours will not look like mine because you don't have any projects yet. So yours will probably be blank over here. That is totally fine. All right. Also, just so you know, I took all of the defaults but there's ways that you can go in. Sometimes people like to work with a dark background where mine will be light, so you can change all that kind of stuff. We're not gonna go over that right now, all right? But what I want you to see are these four options that are right here, okay? The first one probably won't make any sense to you at all, and it's okay. But what that says is, if somebody gave you a file, a project, and they put it into what's called a GitHub repository, you could basically read it from there. All right, we don't have to worry about that right now at all. All right, the second one says, if you've already created a project or a solution, you could click here to open it. All right, this here basically says, if you've got an empty folder or you want, you got something that you want, you can open it. 
the one that we're going to use virtually 100% of the time will be this one right here. Unless you're working with an existing project. All right, if you want to create a new one, we're going to choose that last one that you see right there. So if you do have Visual Studio 2022 loaded and you brought it up, please select create new project from right here. All right, and when you do this again, you might have something here. Yours might be blank, but it shows you all of the different types of projects that you can create in here. And as you can see, there are quite a few of them. All right, and we're going to look at two different ones today. All right, so the ones that we're going to look at, I'm just going to show you because this is different than what I showed you before. You'll see here it says console app. Well, I'm not going to choose that, but I am going to come up here and this is my search bar. I'm going to type in console, C-O-N-S-O-L-E. And you'll notice how this changes. All right, rather than showing as many as it used to, it only shows eight or nine or whatever. We're the, the first app that we're going to create after our next break is going to be a console app. All right, and don't worry about it right now. The other type that you can go and put in here is you can type in, like I did before, Windows Form. And again, you'll notice these are the ones that we've got to choose from. So there's still quite a few in here, but there's you're going to be able to find it from here. All right. So again, what I've shown, <clears throat> excuse me, what I've shown you is how to get into Visual Studio. All right. And I've the only one I've really talked about in here has been the create a new project. All right. Now I'm trying to kind of go along with what they're showing in the book here. So again, they are expecting in here that you've already got some projects in here and we don't, or you don't. Also, I don't think we've got this start learning. I don't think that's on ours. I don't even, I've never seen that before. All right, so to start Visual Studio, I showed you a bunch of different ways. If you've got it on your taskbar as an icon, you can click that icon. If you don't have it on there, you can type into your search box. You can type in Visual Studio 2022. Or you can click your start button and you can find it from there. All right, so any one of those ways should bring it up and it should look like this. All right, they even say that you should probably put it on your desk. Well, I put it on my taskbar, so it's the same thing here. All right. Um, when Visual Studio starts, it displays this start window. All right, and you can use that for a variety of things. Now, it says here the differences between Visual Studio community and other editions. And they do mention that everything they're doing in this book is using the free community edition. And they say that if you're using the professional or the enterprise, it'll work the same, but some of the uh, screenshots are going to look different. Okay, so how to open or close an existing project. All right, well, if I do bring this up, like I showed you, if I have an existing project, I know you don't, but if you would have an existing project in here, you can click on it and it will open it. Okay, that should make sense. This is that garbage one that I just created right before we started. All right, there's nothing in there yet. Then to close it, <clears throat> what will happen, the easiest way to close it, you can click the X up here in the upper right hand corner. But what's considered to be the cleanest way of doing it is to do a file and then go down to exit. Now, if you do a file exit and you've made changes to the file, you will be asked before it closes if you want to save those changes or not. 
And of course, depending on what you're doing, that's your call. All right. Now, so that's how you you can open up an existing project and that's how you can close an existing project. As you'd probably guess, there's more than one way of doing that as well. All right. But those are probably what I'm trying to show you are probably the easiest way of doing these things. All right. So I don't want to sit and read to you. I showed you how to do it graphically. You can do a file open project or a file exit, etc. So there's a lot of ways that you can do this. All right. A key thing for you to understand is if you decide to open it another way, I'm going to show you exactly what I mean right now. All right. So if I come in here and. Oh, where did I put that project? I, I'm going to I'm going to just so you see this. Don't worry about what I'm doing. I'm going to just make a, a folder right now and I'm going to call it junk because I'm going to create a brand new project that's going to be called junk. All right. So I got a folder here called junk. There's nothing in it. I just made it. You can see that it's empty. OK, and I'm going to start up Visual Studio. And now I'm going to say create a new project. All right, and to keep it. I'm going to try to keep this as simple as I can, so I'm going to type in here Windows. And from here, I'm going to find an option. I don't know why it's taking so long, but it is. And it's going to say. This is this is actually changed since the version that I had before. So let's see. All right, we had to go down quite a ways here, but I'm going to choose this where it says. Windows forms dot net framework right there because it's got a C sharp there and we'll go over this again later, but I'm going to just choose that I can either double click on that or single click on it and choose next. Now it says where what do you want to call this? All right, and this is going to be the name of my project. This is going to be the name of the solution, and this is where it's going to live. So I'm going to call this junk project. No, no spaces in there. I'm going to tell it to save it right on my desktop in this folder that I just called junk. And I'm going to call the name of my project. I'm sorry, my name on my project is junk project. I'm going to call the name of my solution junk solution. So why am I going to all this trouble? So I'm going to click create here. Why am I doing this? Because I want to show you what happens with what I just did. Now, very similar to what you saw earlier. All right, but what I want you to see is if you look up here, and I can't make this bigger. I'm sorry. In fact, I guess I can. Let me try this so you can see it. Didn't even think of doing it like this before, but I will anyway. All right, so what you see in here, remember, I named the solution Junk Solution. I named the project junk project. Those are the two things I created based off of what I created. That stuff that you see there in the box properties, references, app.config, form1.cs, and program.cs. Those are system files that were created for me. I want to say that again. I made a project, I told it to go in this solution and I told it where to save it, and then these system files got created for me. All right, so why, who cares? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just put our first little bit of code in here before we take our next break, just so you can see it. So I'm gonna put a button in here, and one of the first things, you're gonna learn all this, but one of the first things you do is when you've got a, a, a control in here, like a button or anything else. All right, so I want to view my 
properties window. There we go. So there's my button, okay? Is you give it a name. So I'm gonna call this for its name. Again, we can call it whatever we would like to call it. I wanna say that again. We can call it whatever we want, but you start with BTN for button. So I'm gonna call it BTN hello. Why? Because what I want is I wanna put on the, some text on that button that says hello. So you can see that it's a little hard to read. So I'm gonna make it bigger. You're gonna to learn to do all this stuff. Like I said, within a couple of days, you'll be doing it as well as, if not better than me. So there's hello. What I wanna have happen is when this program runs, I want it to give me a message on the screen that says hello, that's it. About as simple as possible. So I'm gonna double click on this and it's gonna bring up the code for it. There it is, all right? And I'm gonna tell it when I click on this button, I want a message box to come up. And I want that message box, I want it to say, hello. And I want it to have a title on there that says, welcome to class. All right. I want there to be a button on there that just says OK. And I want there to be another button on there that says that it's information. OK, so I just put these things in there. I don't expect you to understand what any of them mean. But I want to run the program so I can explain to you what all these are doing. So let me run the program by clicking that green checkbox. Normally it won't take this long. It's because we just started. All right. And you'll notice I've got a button here that says hello. Watch what happens when I click it. All right. I'm going to move this down. Hello right there. That's this. Welcome to class right there. That's this. OK button. That's this. And information. That's the I. So that's our first little bit of code, all right? Now, that's all it did, but I could keep clicking it and it'll keep saying, you know, hello to me, as long as I keep clicking it, all right? Well, before we take our break, let's do one more thing. And that is, let's put in one more button here. So I'm just gonna copy this. I'm gonna do a Control C to copy and a Control V to paste, and I'm gonna make another button. I'm gonna change the name of this one so instead of being called BTN exit, like I just showed you, this one's going to be called BT, uh, instead of being called BTN hello, this one will be BTN exit. All right. And I'm going to put the word exit in there. And when I click that button, I just want, I just want everything to close. All right. So I'm going to put in here. I think it'll take a this dot close. All right. OK, so I've just put a little bit of code in here. I'm going to save this and run it again. <clears throat> you already saw this one and what happened. Now when I click exit, program stops. All right, so why did I even take the time to show you that stuff? Well, I did because <clears throat> this right here is our form design window. I used, I went over here to the toolbox, grabbed a button, and I can either drag it over and let go if I want to do that, or I can double click on it and, whoops, and put it in there so you can see them there. All right. Or what is the other one? Um, there is another way to bring it in. I always, Personally, I find what I want here and I drag it over. Not everybody likes to do it like that. All right. Well, one thing, did you notice that when I ran this, stuck it kind of at the top of the screen? Wouldn't it be kind of nice if it was right in the middle of the screen? Well, how do I do that? 
Well, this is my form. Right now it's got, it's just called form1.cs. Well, I mentioned before when we made a button, we gave it a name. We call this BTN hello. We call this BTN exit. We can give our form a name too. So I'm gonna come up here where I've got the form. I'm gonna right mouse click on it. I'm gonna tell it to be renamed. And I'm gonna put in FRM for form. And I'll just call it first form. That's it. And it says, hey, do you wanna change everything? Yes, I do. So now it says here, first form. And you know what? I'm gonna change a couple things on here just so you see them. The first is I don't like that gray back. So where it says back color here, I'm gonna click on that, click the down arrow, click on custom and I'll make it a nice, I don't know, let's make it that color. You may not like that, but you can make it any color you want. All right, and I'm gonna do one more thing. On this form, I'm gonna go down near the bottom and my windows, my start position here, I'm going to choose center screen, that's it. So I'm gonna save my file and I'm gonna run it again and notice the difference. Now it's in the middle of the screen. So when I say hello, it comes right in the middle, as you can see. And when I click exit, boom, it exits. All right, so why did I show you all that stuff? All right, well, I wanna show you. I'm gonna go for just two more minutes and we're taking another 10 minute break. All right, I'm gonna do a file, save all, and then I'm gonna do a file exit. All right, now, this junk program that I just created is right in here. If I double click on the folder, you'll notice there's junk solution. That's the one I made. If I double click on that, there's junk project. But another way that I can start up a project, if I want to, is this is my solution file. So if I double click on the solution file, all right, I tell it, I should only have to do that once till I want to bring it up with that. That's another way I can start the project. It's going to look exactly the same as it did before. Good, bad, or indifferent, there's typically, when I show you one way of doing something, there's typically six ways of doing it. I'm usually not going to show you all six. Why? Because then we'd spend all of our time doing that. I'm going to show you the one or two or maybe three ways that people use most often because I think that makes the most sense. All right. It is just about 1020. Let's take another break and let's come back, please, at 1030. I will see you then.
Have you ever had a whip cracker?
All right, it's 1030, so I'm going to start back up again. I was looking for and found during the break um, this thing right here. Don't worry about what it means, but I'm going to send this to everybody before um, or at the end of class today. And the reason I'm telling you this is it's got on here all the steps that we're going to have to go through. OK, now. What do I want to do for the rest of the class today? Well, what we've been doing now is we've been going through chapter one of our text. I want to continue to do that. And I want us to go through the rest of chapter one. After we do that, I want to have us quickly use Git and GitHub so that you can go and download everything that I have made available for you. All right, everything that I have made available for you on uh, on on the system. And if you don't know what I mean, this is what we're going to do in just a little bit. After we get done with that, then I want us to write one or two very, very simple console applications, followed by one. We're going to recreate our second console application and make it a GUI application. So my guess is, and I talked to Evan about this, and um, I asked, I said, are you giving your students lunch? And he said, yeah, probably I am. So I think what we'll do is between 12 and 1230, if we're not done before then, but if be between 12 and 1230, I'll give you time. So if you wanna, you know, you gotta go to the bathroom, you gotta have lunch, gotta do whatever you're able to do that. All right, then we'll pick it back up again as necessary. We will be done uh, before 2.30 today. All right, I would imagine latest it will go is 1.30, but we'll see how it works. I will tell you that by and large, most days we're going to be here for most of the time. That doesn't mean I'm going to talk for six hours or six and a half hours. Of course not. But what we'll do a lot of times is I'll talk, I'll demonstrate something, then I'll ask you to do it you know, type of thing, and then we'll go back and we'll discuss it. So that's the way a lot of this class is going to be, because it is supposed to mock pretty much what we'd be doing if we were in a regular classroom. All right, so I've already shown you this, but I'm going to close. I'm going to do a file save all and close this. So now you know with this junk thing that's right here, all right, that if I start up Visual Studio, if you have followed along, if you did yours, there's your junk solution right there. So again, I can click there and I can open it. So if I click there, boom, it's opened and it'll take a second, but it'll come back up and it's got my kind of purplish pinkish background and my buttons. Or if I don't want to do that, I can double click on the folder double click on the folder, find my solution file and double click on that. And again, it will come up. There it is. Or one more time, I can start up Visual Studio. And instead of clicking on here, I can click open a project or a solution and I can find it. So again, that was on my desktop, it was under junk. OK, and then I'll have to open that and there's junk solution so I can open it that way. There's even other ways, but that's plenty to show you. All right, what, what I'd like you to do is to determine which of those ways I've shown you is the easiest way for you to do something just use that way all right especially when you're in your first year of the program here you should be programming and working totally towards understandability i want what you're doing to make sense to you there are going to be times i'll show you how to do something and then i might show you a shortcut if the shortcut doesn't make sense to you don't use it right it's totally fine that you don't all right so we went through these project and solution concepts, how to open a project. I showed you how to close a project. Now, the form designer, we've talked about it a little bit. Let's talk about it a little bit more. This is the form designer right here. 
All right. Now, sometimes you're going to bring it up and this won't be showing. This toolbox won't be there. It'll look like this. And you're like, well, how do I bring that toolbox up? So you do that by clicking view on your menu and going down about two thirds of the way and finding toolbox, not toolbars, toolbox. There it is. And you click there. Now, sometimes when you do this, it's going to look like this. It's going to be there. But it's covering up your screen. I mean, it's like this is really hard to work with. So you make it a lot smaller and now you can see your screen, but now you can't read this. Well, when you bring the toolbox up like this, there is a thing in the middle. It's called a pin. It says auto hide, but it, it, it's usually referred to as the push pin. There's three options here. If you click the middle option, then it sizes this and it keeps it on the screen. So notice if I make this bigger, it moves my form over. And as I make it smaller, it moves my form over. All right. So if you if it's not showing your toolbox, you'll do a view and go down the toolbox to show it. In the same way, what if it's not showing over here? What if it's not showing this area that's in here? This is gone and that's gone. So it's not showing these and you want to see them. You can click view. And you can choose Solution Explorer. And I never remember where these are. There it is, about the fourth one down. There that is. And I can do another view. And down towards the bottom is the Properties window. And there's that. So if you ever lose them or they're not showing, that's a way to bring them up. Now, what can confuse people? This is, if I've confused you so far, this is going to be probably the most confusing thing I've shown you. Don't worry. If, if you worry about it, then don't do what I'm about to show you. These things right here, the Solution Explorer, the Properties window, the Toolbox, they're all what are known as dockable. What that means is I can click up here and move this. And I can click over here and I can move this. And I can click over here and I can move this. And now I've got a mess on my screen. And all I want is, geez, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I want it to look the way it looked to begin with. All right, you're going to do this at one time or another because either you're experimenting or you do it accidentally. All right, if this happens to you, you go up here onto your menu at the top and you click tools. All right, and then underneath that, you go to import and export settings so tools import and export settings all right then you just tell it to reset all of your settings and once you say that you click next you can save this god awful thing i've got but i don't want to so i don't want to say yes so i'll just say no just reset everything the way i want it click next again make sure that up here this says Visual C sharp, and then click finish. And close, and lo and behold, everything is back to where it was before. All right. And it's not showing my toolbox. So again, I'll just do a view toolbox. And there that is, and set my push pin again. All right. So the reason I'm mentioning that to you is people say that to me all the time. Hey, I lost everything on my screen or everything on my screen has been moved or whatever. So again, if that happens, you just go to tools, import and export settings, reset all settings. You'll do a next, it'll say, do you wanna save what you have? If you do, you can save it. Typically it was a mistake, so you'll click the no, then click next. Make sure that it's set to visual C sharp. After you set it the first time, it should be set like that from then on. And click finish and boom and close and everything is back to where it was. All right. OK. All right, 
So as we make our way through this chapter, then. On the forum designer, this window looks like some something threw up, but it's pretty much what I've already shown you. I showed you the, the toolbox. I showed you the toolbar. I showed you the solution explorer. I showed you the properties window. And you saw the form designer window. I even showed you how you can move them around and then get them back again. All right. So that's what they explain here. I don't want to sit and read these to you. You should know, and you've already seen this, that to add controls to the form, you use the toolbox. Okay. Now I should also mention to you, just so you're aware of it, that they're right here. If you look again, this is our toolbar. There are other toolbars you can add. So if I go into an empty area up here and I right mouse click, these are all the toolbars I can add. The only one I have up here is the standard toolbar. But for example, if I wanted the debug toolbar as well, watch what happens when I click debug. Now I've got these things added. How do I know that? I'm going to remove it. And now you can see they went away. I typically have the standard one and the debug one up there. That's what you have up there is totally up to you. I cannot see your screen anyway. All right. OK. Now, as far as using the code editor, there'll be some stuff in here that you do that you'll probably think, well, that's cool. And other stuff that you do in here that you'd be like, oh, I, I don't like that at all. All right, what do I mean? Well, let's take a quick look. So let's go back into our code here. And what you may or may not have noticed when we came in here, move this all the code, is this stuff is color coded. What do I mean? Keywords in the language are this color blue, that blue right there. All right, I'm not sure exactly why they use this color, but these are non keywords, but they're basically stuff that deal with keywords and they're in a teal or whatever you'd call that. When you put something in double quotes, it goes in in red. And if you make what are called comments, and we'll get into that in just a bit, all right, you'll notice if I make a comment in here <clears throat> where I say this is a comment <clears throat> on one line. You can see that it's green. If I want to comment on multiple lines, this is a comment on multiple lines. And you can see how I do both of those. So those are green. So again, everything in here is color coded. Things that aren't keywords or, or whatever, they're just typically put in there in black. OK, all right. So just want to show you what was in there, OK? So there's a few things in here about the code editor. Again, I am not reading to you out of the book, so I'm expecting that even though I'm going over the stuff in here, you're still going to read the book. And if something that's in the book either seems to contradict what I am saying or you don't understand something that's in the book and I didn't go over in class, I'll expect you to ask. So if you're in class live with me, you can ask. Otherwise, you can email me and I'll do the best I can to answer your question as soon as I possibly can. All right, so next is the Solution Explorer. We already talked about this a little bit. There's the name of the solution. There's the name of the project. These are all files within the project. Some of these files that are in here, you will not only, not only will you never touch, you should never touch. Any file that's in there, I shouldn't say any, but most any file that's in there that was created for you, you won't want to touch. What do I mean? Well, when we look in here, this file right here, that's got a little 
like a, a, a square on here with something in it, that's this file. All right. And if I right mouse click on that file and I choose view code, that's the code for the file. But the other stuff that's in here, normally, you won't touch properties, you won't touch reference, you won't touch app config, you won't touch this designer file, and you won't touch this file. You just don't touch them. This file right here that says program.cs, this is the file that run that makes the program run. In fact, that's the line right there that tells it to run our program. You typically won't touch that file either. But a very easy way to get this program where you get, for lack of better words, this is not at all a, um, a regular term, but to get yourself in stuck mode, for lack of better words, is to sit and open up one of these system files. That we will look at some of these as we go on in here. All right. But usually, at least, you don't want to touch them. All right. So if you want more about the project files, there they are. OK, there's stuff in here that right now, you know, why was this named this? Why that's it, really and truly not as important as you starting to gain at least a fundamental understanding of what we're trying to do in here. All right. Now, how to work with the windows? They're showing you like I did how the stuff is dockable and how you can move stuff around. I already showed you that how you can rearrange windows so that you know you can rearrange your whole screen if you want. It's totally up to you. All right. How to change the .NET version of your project. This is kind of important. All right. It says if you open up a project that targets an older version, it can lead to issues. What you're going to see in this book is the authors are going to say, they're going to show you how to do something. Then they very well might say, now with, with versions 9, 10, and 11, now you can do it like this. So if you're using a version before 9, 10, or 11, those things that they tell you about won't be available to you. Well, how do you even figure that out? All right, we go to this project properties window. How do we get there? Well, we come in here, we go to project, and we go down to the bottom, the properties window right there. That's the same window there that you see here. It may not look exactly the same, but it basically it is. All right. And it says, what are we using in here for for different things? We'll talk about this at a different time. Again, the idea today is to get us up and running and working. It's not showing you 10,000 things where I'm never going to remember this. I'm never going to remember this. That's not the idea behind this. OK. And there will probably come a time when you accidentally click a wrong button or whatever. It really and truly is not that important. All right. Well, OK, Jeff, but I clicked this wrong button and now I'm stuck. Well, if that's the case, then you'll have to ask. All right. OK. So let's see. I think we went over that. OK. Now. I've already built a project for you. I put two buttons on it. All right. And I ran that project. So you saw this already Ooh, there. OK, this is their own project, so don't worry about that. OK, and I showed you how to exit a project, etc. Now that's it for chapter one. So what we're going to do right now between now and our next break is I'm going to come through and everything that I do in here today other than this goofy project with two buttons on it. But everything that we do today, I'm going to save and I'm going to put it out there. So if you run into any problems, you'll be able to go out and grab it. All right. But this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to close this project that I've got open right now. I don't need this project. And I'd like you to please, I'm taking for granted you've all been able now to download the software that we need. We're not going to worry about Git. 
or GitHub until after our next break. All right. But what we're going to do instead is, and this is the way I do it. You don't have to do it this way. So sometimes I'm going to do something and it will not exactly be done the way that it's done um, in the book. And that is totally okay. Please don't let that bother you at all. I'm just showing you, you know, over time, I've learned to do things ways that are not in the book. If I do something and you're like, well, that makes more sense than the way they did it in the book, then try it that way. If I do something and you're like, boy, what they did in the book makes a lot more sense, then do it that way. All right. But what we're going to end up doing throughout the semester, we're starting it right now. But what we're going to go end up doing throughout the semester is we're going to make our own C sharp payroll system. I want to say that again. We are going to make our own C sharp payroll system. We're going to start today. It's going to be almost remarkably simple. All right, we're going to create two console apps right now. And then we're going to go and we're going to create a Windows Forms or a GUI app. So we're going to do that now. Like I said, I'm going to save everything that I do, but this is the way I'm going to do it. So I'm going to come to a blank spot on my desktop. I'm going to right mouse click. You can do the same and choose new and choose folder just like that. And I'm going to call the folder payroll capital P lowercase a Y R O L L one word when you are creating stuff in here. Put blank spaces between words, please run things together. All right, so I've got a new folder in there that I just made that I called payroll. Just so you can see it is totally empty. All right, there's my payroll. I'm going to put it way up here so it's all by itself so you can see it in there. Now I'm going to start up. Visual Studio by clicking on my uh, on my bar here, whatever the heck this is called. It's. I don't know, I think it's a taskbar. I don't I always get it mixed up, but I'm going to click there. So this is starting up my Visual Studio. I don't want to bring up this junk solution that we just did. No, I'm going to create a new project right now. I want to say this again. I'm going to create a new project right now. All right. This new project that I'm going to create the first one it's going to be a console application, so it's going to be real ugly when it runs. That's fine. The second one that we create will be not quite as ugly, but it'll still be ugly because it'll be another console application. That's fine. All right, then the third one that we run will be a GUI app. It'll look much nicer, but since the first couple we want to do our console apps, I'm going to come up here and I'm going to type in console up in my search up here. And I don't want the one that just says console app. I might have to go down a ways, but I want to find the one that says. Oh, where are you? I know it's in here. Way down, about halfway down. Console app dot net framework C sharp right there. Console app dot net framework. C sharp. Now let's see if I grabbed. Let's see if I came in here and did this. If I typed in console framework, well, notice now it's right near the top. In fact, it is at the top. So I can type in console framework or like console app. All right, and then put in here like dot net. There it is. All right, I want to make sure I choose the one that says C sharp on it. Console app dot net framework C sharp. Now I can click it and click next or I can double click it. All right, and that gets me to here. Now it asks me what I want to call my project. We're going to take every payroll program that we create. We're going to put all of them and there will probably I'm going to guess here there might be 30 or 40 of them. We're going to put all of them in this folder called payroll. All right, so this first project that we create will be called payroll. 
console zero one. If you can't read that, I want to show it to you because I want you to be able to read it. That's what I called it. Again, no blank spaces in here. So payroll console zero one. And here's the surprise. When we get done with that, we're going to create payroll console two. And when we get done with that, we're going to create payroll GUI zero one. Those are the three projects I want us to create today. All right, so this is the first one. So that's what I'm going to give it for a project name. You don't have to put the word project in there. You can, but we don't have to. So this is payroll console zero one. All right. Where's the location? I want it to go right in that folder I just made. So I'm going to click the ellipsis here, the three dots, and I'm going to find it by clicking desktop and there's payroll. All right. So now it made this payroll console zero one. And for me, it's C colon backslash users backslash JP Scott backslash desktop backslash payroll. OK, now I need to give it a solution name. That's going to be the big folder that holds all these. And I'm going to call this. Payroll projects again with no blank spaces. Now, just so you see it. This is what I did. So I called my project name payroll console 01. Again, no blank spaces in here. Typically, you run things together, and this is called right here Pascal case, where the first letter of each word is capitalized. So payroll console, I put it into a folder called payroll, and I called my solution payroll projects, just like that. If you've got all that in there, don't worry about the framework. Just leave it to whatever yours is set for and click create. Now this is going to then what we did before because we're now making a console app. All right, if you get something that looks like this, it worked. Now we could run this right now, but absolutely nothing would show on the screen. Just to show you this, it might even go like that and blink real fast. So I'm running it. There it is. Boom, that was it. Because there's nothing there because we haven't put any code in yet. All right. Again, I'm assuming that if you are watching this live with me, that if you've got a question on something or I'm going too fast, you're going to stop me. Now, what we want to do is for our first example, because we want it to be real simple, we're going to just put ourselves in there. OK, so you're going to put in your first name. You're going to put in your last name. You're going to put in the number of hours you worked. You're going to put in your hourly rate, and it's going to show you how much money you made. OK, that's all we're doing for this first example. All right, so we're going to come in here, like I said, to keep it real simple. I'm going to do this and we're going to go over all of it. So if it doesn't make sense, please just bear with me until we're done writing it. So I'm going to type in here string lowercase everything and we're going to put in here first name equal. Put your first name in there. Unless your name is Jeff Scott, I wouldn't put that in. Put in your name. So string. Last name and put in your last name again in double quotes, not single quotes. They mean something else in this language. All right, and now I'm going to put in. Um, decimal. And I'm going to put in hours and I'm going to say I worked 40.0. I have to put an M in there. We'll go over that. 
And I'm going to say that I make $25 an hour decimal rate. And I'm going to say that's equal to 25.00 M. And I could put two zeros here. I can put one zero there. I can put no zeros there and just put 40 M. It doesn't matter. Then finally, I'm going to say decimal gross equal hours times rate. Now, believe it or not, all we have to do now is print this out and then we're done. But let's talk about what we've done in here so far. First of all, you've got to put everything that we're doing so far within this static void main between the curly brace and the ending curly brace. So we've added in here five things. Each one of these things that we added in there is what's known as a variable. Because while the program's running, if we wanted to, we could change or vary what it holds. All right. So we've got two string variables at the beginning. What does that mean? That means they hold text. The first string variable is called first name, and it holds the text Jeff. The second string variable is last name and it holds the text Scott. Then we've got three variables of type decimal. And decimal are typically used for dollars and cents, or we can use it anytime we want something that can conceivably have a decimal place in it, or a decimal point, decimal places. Now, if I want to be real quirky here and line this stuff up, I can. But what you'll notice is by default, let me add this one again. If I if I come in here and do this, and I put in here equal hours times rate, looks fine until I hit the semicolon. Then it bounces back. So if you're real quirky, and I am somewhat, and you want everything to line up, you've got to put it in and then go back and line it up. And if you say, geez, do I have to line it up? Heck no. If you don't want any of it to line up, I could care less. All right. So now what I want to do is I want to print out all of this information, including, including my gross that we've calculated. All right. There's a lot of ways that we can do this. There are a lot of ways we can do this. I'm going to show you a way of doing it. So I'm going to come in here again and do another string. And I'm going to put in here output str. All right. And all that means is this is going to be an output string. And I'm going to be, make it equal to at the beginning, nothing. Now, I want to say something to you. Right here, this, what you see in blue, not the whole line. What you see in blue right there, it's called a variable declaration. I am declaring a called first name. This is initializing a variable. So now I am saying take Jeff and assign it to the variable first name. When you put these together, it's a variable initialization. I'm sorry, it's a variable declaration and initialization. So again, I'm declaring six variables in here. Five of these variables, I'm giving an initial value to. The last variable, I'm not. This says empty. I could have even put in there if I wanted to string dot empty. I could have put that in, but why do I want to type that much when all I have to do is type in that? All right. If it makes more sense to you to type in string.empty, do that. Now, what I want to print out, I'm going to show you on here. All right. So this is what I want to print out. All right. I want it to say name and then Jeff Scott. Then I wanted to say hours, 
and I want it to say 40.00. Then I want it to say rate and 25.00. And finally, I want it to say gross and 1,000.00. That's what I want. This is what I want to print out based on this. So I'm going to take this output string and I'm going to fill it up for lack of better words. So it says all that stuff. All right. How do I do that? I'm going to show you that right now. So I'm going to say output string. I gave it an initial value of here of nothing. I could just say equal right here, but I'm going to say plus equals. That means add to whatever is there. Well, right now, what's there? Not much, just an empty string. So I'm going to say in here, name. Remember, we wanted it to say name first. Then after that, I'm going to say, I'm going to put in the first name and the last name. So first name, then a blank space, then last name. So that's what I want so far. All right. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to check right now and see if while I'm doing this, did it work? In other words, right now, if I run this, will it say name Jeff Scott? Will it do that? Let's see. Now, you're going to see here why there's going to be another line of code. We got to put it underneath this, but watch. Boom. What, what, what the heck happened? Well, we never told it to, to print that output string. OK. So we're going to come in here and I'm going to type in this right now. Console. Dot right line output string. OK, that's good, but it's still not where we want it because watch. Yeah, printed it, but you just didn't see it. It went away. All right, so we have to add one more line down here that says console dot read line. Just like that, which tells it the program to stop until we hit a key. Now let's see if right now, let's see if it's starting to look the way we want it to look. So file, save all, and let's run it. And then we've got name Jeff Scott. Okay, that's a start, it's not perfect. And notice if I hit a key now, it just stops running. So, so far what we've done is we've taken these two string variables that we declared and we put them into that's got a heading of name, a colon, then a blank space. Then we put in the value of first name, which is Jeff, and then a blank space, and then the value of this, which is Scott. That's a good start. We're not done yet, but we got a good start. All right, so we've got the name. And now we want to go in and we want to put in the hours. All right. So let's keep going and doing it kind of the same way. So I'm going to say output str plus equal. Oops, I'm sorry. Plus equal. We want this one to say hours. All right. And a space plus. Now, the problem we could run into with this, we want to just say hours here. Okay. And that's OK. It'll probably even work if we put a semicolon here. But we want it to say hours and we want it to have two decimal places. Let's say this again. We want it to have hours. And remember, we want it to say this, not with an M, but 40.00. All right. So to do that, we're going to tell it, hey, make it a string but put in there a number with two decimal places. I don't expect that to totally make sense. All right, but let's take a look at this. Let me save it. All right, and you're going to see there's a problem with it right now, and that's OK. Save all and run it. Well, it doesn't look bad, except it's all in one line. So we've got to put it on two lines. So what I'm going to do is before I put in hours here, 
I'm going to put in what's called a backslash N. That's like I hit the enter key. Okay, so now let's take a look at it. And now we've got name and we've got hours. Okay, it may not be totally perfectly lined up. That's okay. All right, if we really wanted to be goofy about that, I could put in another blank space there or something like that. All right, so we've now got name in there and we've got hours. Well, the next thing we want is the rate. All right, so I'm going to just copy this line down. All right, I'm going to change this to rate. Okay. And now I'm going to put in rate. But when you list somebody's rate, you typically want to have a dollar sign with it. So this just said make it a number with two decimal places, but I want this to be currency format. So I put a C in there for currency. All right, let's take a look at what we have now. It's getting there. Jeff Scott, 40, 25. So the only thing we've got left is to put in our gross pay. All right, so let's put that in. And I want that to be gross. And again, two string with currency. Let's check and see what it looks like. So there you go. Again, not perfect, but not bad either. I guess I need one more blank space in here. And then it'll pretty much look the way that I showed you to begin with. So I will put that blank space right there. I will save it. I will run it again and see if it all lines up. And you can see that it does. All right, now this was not a gee whiz type of thing. It's kind of nice because it's a first example. It's a simple program, even though it may not seem simple. All right, but let's break it down by starting at the top, okay? You'll notice that there's a line here that says using system, and that line is blackened, the word system. Then there's four lines here that say using system dot something that are gray. All right. The gray ones mean the gray lines there means they're not being used. So what I can do if I want is two things. I can highlight all of them and hit delete, and it doesn't hurt my program at all. Or I want to show you what's built into this system that's called IntelliSense. All right, and that is I can take my mouse and put it over this one. And you'll notice it says. Using directive is unnecessary. And then it says show potential fixes. Well, what I can do when I get that is it shows me over here this fix, this little key thing. If I click there, it says remove anything you don't need. And it got rid of them as well. All right. So what is this file that's left in line one? What is using system? What is that? All right. And the answer is what it is. All right. Is it is a system file? All right. What does that mean? Well, if you look in here, this said to write something on the screen. This said to read something. But they both say console dot all right who cares well that console thing is how to use that is defined in this system file in fact if i wanted to i could put here system dot console on both of these so that's where that's defined okay now if you're like me you like to type as little as possible. So I don't want to have that word system in there because it's unnecessary. And guess what? 
not currently. I got to make one more change up here, but this word isn't necessary either. The word console. If I come in and underneath this, I'm going to type in this. Using. Static and the word static is lowercase. System dot console like that. Now when I type that in. I no longer have to use the word console with a period. And you'll see that I don't get any errors. Now you don't have to do that, but I tend to do that a lot in my console programs because again, I don't like to do any more typing than I have to do. And you'll also notice that now that I put this in, this turned gray. So guess what? I don't need that statement anymore. And the program will still work. So this allows me to go in and use a system file where this system.console has been defined. All right. Everything that you do when you create a project goes inside of what's called a namespace. That namespace by default will be the same name as the name of your project. So namespace payroll console one, payroll console one. All right. C sharp is what's known as a block structured language. And what what that means, whoops, I don't know what I did there, but what that means being a block structured language is that everything goes within curly braces. So there's the beginning curly brace, there's the ending curly brace. Then inside of here, I've got this thing, there's the beginning curly brace, there's the ending curly brace. Inside of there, I've got something called main. There's the beginning curly brace. There's the ending curly brace. All right. So what does all this mean? Namespace is basically kind of the collection. It's the holder for lack of better words. All right. Now, I'm going to say something to you. You don't have to worry a bit about it right now, but C sharp is what's known as an object oriented programming language. Everything you do in C sharp is done directly or indirectly using what are called classes. You'll notice we've got a class here that's called program. And you'll notice that it's an internal class. We'll have a whole chapter later on in the book where we'll click and private and protected and internal. Let's just say for now, this is a statement the system puts in here that says what follows is our program. All right. When you write a console app, you must have a main in it. When you write a console app, you must put a main in it. All right. And the way we're writing this right now, this will change in the future. But the way that we're writing this right now, all our code goes inside of main. We will change this as we go on and start writing things that are more and more complex. All right. Now you'll notice it says static. What the heck does that mean? And you may or may not have noticed it up here. It said static. Do they mean the same thing? The answer is yes. All right. If something is static, there's a couple things, but for now, what you have to know is there's only one of them and it gets shared. Now you'd say, wait a minute, you just said there's only one, and there's one here and there's one here. Yes, but they're referring to two different things. This static is referring to this and this static is referring to this. So there's only one main and the whole program shares it. All right. Now, main, not main, but when you write a routine, don't worry about what routines are, but when you write code, what's going to end up happening eventually is we're going to take a program like this and break it up into smaller chunks. 
And each one of those chunks can potentially return a value to us. We're not returning a value here. So we are what are known as void of a return value. There isn't one. The name of the routine this right here is main. It is, this language is case sensitive. Don't make that, don't play with that, don't make that a little m, etc. All right. Now, although we will never use it, it is legal to go and pass things into main. We're not doing that. But if you want to pass things into main, you pass them in in what's called a string array that's called args. You don't have to worry a bit about this. And these two brackets mean that it's an array. We don't go through arrays until chapter eight. All I'm trying to do is explain this entire program to you. That's all I'm trying to do right now. All right, so inside of main between our curly braces, we are declaring and initializing our different variables. Now I put them in the order they're used. Some people like to go and say, you know what? Those are strings, all the strings should be together. That's totally fine. Again, you should be own style in here. So we have three string variables. The first one is initialized to my first name. The second one is initialized to my last name. The third one is initialized to what's called the empty string, meaning there's nothing in it. Then we have three decimal variables. Hours, rate, and gross. Hours is initialized to 40.00. Since it is a decimal variable, when you initialize or give a decimal variable a value, you have to put an M on the end. It can be an uppercase M like I showed you, or it can be a lowercase M. And if you say, well, what if I don't want to do that? What if I don't, you know, is there a way around that? The answer is yes. We, instead of making these decimals, we could have made these doubles. And if you make them a double, you don't need to use the M. All right, I'm just going to leave them the way they are with decimals. So we've got one decimal for hours, one for rate, and then we got a new variable gross that says that's this times this. Now, if we did if we did this and we put that variable before the other ones, we'd get errors because we're trying to use gross with hours and rate, and we haven't yet declared hours and rate. The system is confused. When the system is confused, you lose. That's just the way it is. So you have to do things in a certain way. So now that we have both declared and initialized hours, and we've declared and initialized rate, now that we've done both of those, now we can multiply one by the other and put that into gross. All right, so here I'm going to put a, I'll put in a comment and it will say declare and initialize program variables. All right, I mean, I could be real nuts here and say this is first name, this is last name, This is our output string. This is the hours that we worked. Whoops. This is the hourly rate. And this actually is, when you think about it, this is hours worked times hourly rate. Okay, so we could do that if we wanted to. I mean, that's a little nuts with the comments, but you get the idea. And here we could just say build output string because that's what we're doing. And here we are going to display the output string. 
OK, so I, I mean, I put a lot of comments in there because I want you to be able to see exactly what's happening in the program. So when we build this, the only thing I really don't like, I don't know about you, I had to count. Uh, there were three spaces here. There were two here. There were three here. I don't like that. Can I get around that? The answer is yes. I'm going to change these. I'm going to get rid of all these spaces. This meant hit the enter key. New line, that's what the N stands for. I'm going to put in here a backslash T, which means add the equivalent of a tab in there. Now, this may not be perfect. It may still be lined up a little funky. I don't know. But I'm going to put the, all these in as backslash T's. And I'll line up my little plus signs here. All right. And now I'm going to save this and run it again. And it looks like it didn't line up. Sometimes you've got to be creative when you do backslash T's and whatever on this to, to print this out. All I wanted it was to be an acceptable looking format. It doesn't look great, but it's totally fine. I could have put a title on here if I wanted to. All right, so in other words, where we did this output string right here, I could have started by coming in here and said, output str plus equal something like payroll calculator something like that and then put a backslash n at the end which would have given us a new line right there okay we could have done something like that and then what you'll see is now we get that so there's a lot of ways we could refine this make changes to this, et cetera, all right? This, again, when we have write lines, it says write it to what's called the default output device. That's your screen. This says read from your default output device, which is your keyboard, all right? Now, we've got our first program done. That's good, all right? But, but, a couple things. First of all, you may or may not have noticed, but every time we run this, we get the same output. So wouldn't it be nice if we could run this program more than once and, and give, ask the person their first name, ask the person their last name, ask the person the hours that they worked, et cetera. That's what we're going to do in the next version of this program. All right, we are making it more, what's referred to as we're going to make it more extensible all right you can imagine it it's kind of like taffy or whatever and we're pulling it all right just to, to, to make it do things that would normally be able to do all right so that's our first program now just i'm going to show you two more things and we can take another break next i'm going to come in here and i'm going to close this so my project is closed right now there it is all the files are still there I can double click and open it if I want to, but I don't want to. All right. So I want to create another project in here. So I'm going to right mouse click right there. I'm right mouse clicking on the name of my solution. I'm going to choose add and I'm going to choose new project again. And I want it to be another console app. With a dot net here. So the same type I just made right there. This time I'll single click on it and choose next. And I've got one called payroll console one. So this will become payroll console zero two. I don't have to tell it the location because I already set it up. It'll go right underneath the other one and I don't have to set the framework. So I click create. And there it is. So there's my second one right there. Now, the only problem is I'm going to put something in here just so you see it. I'm going to remove this in a minute, but I'm going to type in here console dot right line. Hello. And then I'll do a console dot read line so you can see it. All right, now let me run this and guess what? It ain't going to show. 
it ran my last program. And it did that because it thinks that's the active program. So to change this, I'm going to right mouse click on the name of the new project I just made and choose set as startup project about halfway down. Set as startup project. Now I'm going to run it again. And now notice it just says hello. All right. Just to, so you see this, from the last program, I am going to come in here from our the first program that we created, okay? I am going to come in there and I'm going to grab all this code, but I'm going to I'm just going to change it all around. But I'm going to grab it so I've got something to start with. All right. So let me get rid of that. And come back in here. And now I'm going to get rid of all this. Now I've got two programs that are identical to one another, except on here, I didn't say static system dot console and get rid of these. Now they're identical. If I run this second program, if I run this, it looks just like the first one, exactly the same. And just so you know, it's the new one. I'll change this to payroll calculator two. So I'm only changing the second one, the one I just am, am doing right now. And notice now it says payroll calculator two. All right. So it is 1131. Let's take 10 minutes. All right. And then we'll come back. And when we come back, we're going to rewrite this whole program here and we're going to rewrite it as another console app where we will ask the user information. All right, come back at 1141, please.
All right, it is 1141, so I'm going to start back up. I'm going to show you something here. Um, if you remember earlier, I went up to the top here and I set debug. OK, and now I removed it. All right, but it's going to allow me later in a later chapter to debug a bunch of stuff. OK, but for right now, notice I'm getting a bunch of errors in here. That's because I've removed the values that I put in for these. So really what I want to do is I want to comment all these out. So comment, 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 comment. You know what? That was too much work. And I don't have to do it like that. Instead, what I can do is highlight all the lines I want to comment out. Come up on the top in the up here onto my toolbar. And about four or five from the end, there's a thing there that says comment out the selected text. And if I click it, now it's all commented out. If I comment the one next to it, it uncomments it. All right, so it's a toggle that goes back and forth. All right, I'm going to keep that because later we'll use that. But before we do, I want to show you something. And I don't know if you know what the word superfluous means, but or extraneous, but I'm going to do something right now that I don't have to do. So I'm going to come in here and say equals the empty string equals the empty string, equals 0, 0.0 M, equals 0, 0.0 M, and finally equals 0, 0.0 M. All right, now you, what you may notice, you might notice it, you might not, I don't know, but what you may notice is that a bunch of these are gray. All right. And it says, first it says the variable is assigned a value but never used. But then underneath it, it's got another thing here that says unnecessary assignment. What I'm telling you is, if I leave this off, I'm going to leave off all these here and this and this. Why? because their default values are nothing, which means by default, if I don't give them a value, they are automatically initialized to the empty string, which is what I want in there anyway. I want that to be the empty string. So I can put it in, but it's considered extraneous and unnecessary. In the same way here, these are gray, and it says, um, let's see. If I come in here and do this, I'm going to remove that. And I'm going to remove that. And I'm, whoops, I don't need an M there. And I'm going to remove that. Just like that. So they're now all removed. All right. And what I'm getting to is by default, which means unless told otherwise, the system will go and it will automatically set these variables up for me as though I had done that. Now, not every language does that, but notice now I'm getting a bunch of errors here, but the reason I'm getting these errors is because they're warnings. If you get something in green, it's a warning, not an error. And it's telling me I've got these variables that I'm not using, so let's use them, all right? But now, Let's go in and ask the user. We're going to do this. We're going to say right line. Enter your. First name. In fact, we're going to say the word right, not right line. You'll see why in a minute. All right, and then I'm going to say first name. Equals read line, just like that. Now, I'm going to go and uncomment. In fact, I'm going to, I'm, let me put this in again. And then we'll say, enter your last name. And last name. 
Okay, we're going to go over what all this means, but I'm going to uncomment this line and I'm going to uncomment this line and I'm going to uncomment this line. Now, why is it giving me an error there? It says use of unassigned variable. OK, it does want me to assign a value to output string. All right. But what I want to show you is. Let's see what how this has changed, OK, with these lines I just put in. So let me save this. Now when we run it. Now it says name, so if I want to say Bill and enter your last name and I want to say Jones. Now it says Bill Jones. But if I go back and I run it again. I can now say Mary Green. And it's Mary Green. All right, now what you may or may not have noticed is I have to rerun the program every time. Later in a later chapter, we'll learn about looping where we can run the program again and again and again without stopping. All right, but notice the first thing here is we didn't say a right line. We said right. What that meant was say enter your first name with a space, but then stay on the same line we were on. That's what we're reading in here. So the read line meant when I when I went in there and entered Bill. And hit enter. That was what got put into that read line that got sent to first name. Then when I put in, it gave me the message, enter your last name, and I put in Jones and hit enter, that got into last name. So now I've got those two things. Let's put in the other ones. So let me just copy this. Now I'm going to say, enter your hours. worked. All right, and then this one will be ours. Now this isn't going to work, but we'll figure out why in just a minute. And this will say enter your hourly rate. All right, now let's I like them to be lining up, so let's put HRLY hourly rate. All right. And this is going to say rate. And that's going to give us an error. We're going to talk about now, right now, why we're getting those errors. OK, we're trying to mix apples and oranges. What do I mean? Whatever you whenever you've got a read line, whatever you put in there, it can be numbers, it can be words, it can be anything. It goes in as text or as a string. Doesn't matter if I come in here and put in 40. It's not the number 40. It is the text string four zero, which has no arithmetic value. So the program is going to break. So how do I fix that? I come in here and I say, you know what? This is a decimal, so parse it. In other words, in other words, convert it for me. OK, so decimal dot parse read line now doesn't like this. I think it might be a little D. There we go. And we can do the same thing here. All right, now let's uncomment these. OK. Now we we didn't do the gross yet. That's why we're getting that error. So now we can say gross equals hours times rate. All right. Now our program should function like it did before, but we're able to put in different values for each one of our inputs. So we'll run it again. And Mike worked 35 hours and makes 20 bucks an hour. So there it is. 700 bucks. Okay. Now again, we to run it again. 
we've got to really literally run the program again. So let's put in Sally Smith. And Sally worked a lot last week, 60 hours, and she makes $50 an hour. $3,000. That all works. Now, a couple things. All right. First of all, I want this set up. So I'm going to print, I'm going to put in all this information. And after I put it in and I hit enter, after I put in this last one, I want my screen to refresh and I want this to be on its own screen. And that's not hard to do. And the way I do that is I come down here when I want this to, to run right here, I'm going to say clear. I'm just telling it to clear the screen. Let's see if that worked. All right, and her first name, Betty, last name, Brown. She worked 20 hours and makes $25 an hour. Now notice my screen cleared and I get the output information. All right, now we're virtually done with this program except, and we're going to learn this in a different lecture when we go on a little bit, okay? But for right now, this works fine as long as I as I abide by the rules. What the heck does that mean? Let's show you. All right, we'll put Kelly. There, and we're going to put in, we're going to leave this blank. In fact, let's just put in hello. And the program blows up. And it blows up because we're trying to take a non numeric value and parse or convert it into a numeric value. So it tells us it's it's throwing what's called a system format exception. This is the message it gives us. And it's telling us we're breaking the rules. We can't do this. All right. So how do you fix that? Well, that's in like about chapter six or seven. So for right now, we're going to take the fact that you can put bad data in, break the program. Now in the first program, we were not inputting anything in that first example. We were hard coding in the first name, the last name, the hours worked and the hourly rate. Since we hard coded those in, there was nothing to screw up, so to speak. But here we have that. All right. So that's it for our first two programs. They're both console apps. I'm going to close this and now we're going to go back and rebuild the one we just did, but we're going to rebuild it as a GUI or a graphical user interface app. All right. And the good news is I'll be able to steal a lot of my code. So I'm going to come back here. I'm going to again right mouse click on my solution. I'm going to choose add and I'm going to do a new project again, but this time I want this to be a Windows Windows form app. And remember, I've got to go down a little bit to find it. Windows form app, there it is. So I'm going to click on it and click next. This one I'm going to call Payroll Console GUI, GUI01. So payments, payments, not console, I'm sorry. Pay, payroll, try that again. Payroll GUI01. And hit enter. And there that one is. You can see it built more files for me. And I've got this in here now too. All right, we can make this look any way we want it to look. I'm going to make it look very simplistic or probably what I'd refer to as very pedestrian looking. All right, so let me move that over. There we go. Whoops, let me try that again. View my toolbox. And there we go. All right, what I like to do, and you don't have to do this, you do not have to do this, but I don't like the gray color for a form. 
So what I'm going to do is the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the form here and I'm going to change the color. Now, when you click, it's under this properties window and it's under back color. Notice it's set to control, which is that grayish. But if I click on that, and then it gives me a little down arrow here. If I click on the down arrow, I can use system settings, which are right here, or I can use web settings, which are right here, but they're kind of limited. So I'm going to use custom. Now I can use any of these colors or even make my own if I want. Let's use the bright or the, the kind of dull orange. Again, you could put anything you wanted in there. All right, so that's the first thing. So I've come through there and I've changed the background color of my form. Fine, dandy. The next thing I want to do is I want to change what's up here because it just says form one right now. I want to change the text up there. So on my form, I'm going to go down to where it says text. And I'm going to change it and I'm going to say. Payroll GUI 01. Because that's exactly, I'm going to put spaces in there, but that's okay. Because it's just the title. All right. Then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change the name of the form. You can change it up here. I'd recommend always changing it in here. And how do I do that? Where it says form1.cs, I'm going to right mouse click on that. Choose rename. I want to keep the .cs. So I'm going to call it FRM for form, and I'm going to call this payroll 01 and hit enter. And it says, hey, you're about to change the name. Do you want to change? Do you want to change any reference to this form any place, even in system files? Yes, I do. So now you'll notice that this changed to FRM payroll 01. So did this and so did this. So now I've changed that. All right. OK. Now what we're going to get. With this example is the ability to run the program over and over and over again without having to use a loop. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add three buttons. I'm just going to bring one button down. I'm going to change the size. All right, and then I'm going to take that button. Do a control C to copy and do two control V's to paste it twice. And what you'll notice is as I'm putting this in here, I'll get these lines. These are grid lines to line things up. See that? So now I've got my three buttons and they're pretty much. Pretty much the way I want them to look all lined up next to one another. All right. Now I'm going to make a couple more changes, but I'll do that in a little bit. So I've got those three things. Now, what do I, what else do I have in here? First name, last name, okay. Uh, hours worked, hourly rate, and gross pay. So I got five things I'm going to put in here. Let me move these down to the very bottom. All right. And now I'm going to need five labels. So here's the first label. 